Cordy in progress. The chair notes the time is 6.04. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, a ZBA chair. I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call members, a roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Present. Mr. Everald Henry. Here. Oh, just in time. <laughs> Mr. Philip White. Present. And Ms. Hilda Greenbaum. Present. The quorum is present. Also attending to the public hearing tonight is Christine Brestrup, Planning Director, Mr. Rob Wachilla, Planner for the Town, and Carolyn Murray, our uh, counsel on this matter, KP Law. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings of the, are open to the public and are recorded by town staff, and they may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or to gather additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair will be, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address for the board, to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is where the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Tonight's agenda. Uh, consideration of the minutes from 11 30 23 and 12 7 23. A public hearing on ZBA FY 2024 03, Valley Community Development Corporation, request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40B, to construct 30 owner occupied affordable residential units located in 15 duplex structures, parking areas with 58 spaces common areas and other site improvements on a 9.047 acre site with requested waivers from the zoning bylaws, general bylaws, subdivision regulations, sewer water connection approvals at 2040 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Parcel 56, RN, Neighborhood Residence, and RLD, Low Density Residential Zoning Districts, and FC, Farmland Conservation Overlay Zoning Districts. This is continued from January 4th, 2024. So uh, after that, uh, general public comment on matters not before the board tonight, other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours and adjournment. The first order of business is the consideration of minutes from November 30th, 2023 and December 12th, 7th, 2023. Let's first consider the minutes from November meeting November 30th. Are there any uh, questions, concerns, or corrections to the minutes for that meeting? That was the meeting on, I, I have one, um, Rob. On page five, we begin the discussion of planning board comments. And then we have references to planning board members um, throughout the next, this section of planning board comments. And I think some of those are, should be um, Zoning Board of Appeals comments. If you note, some planning board members questioned whether the amount of lighting proposed, for, that, that's true. That's what some planning board members mentioned. And then planning board comments, then we start to delete, uh, delineate the comments from the Z Zoning Board of Appeals. 
So I think that that second reference to planning board should be the uh, zoning board of appeals. I think the same thing is, um, I think that what happens here is we've got planning board comments and then the response of the people at our meeting mm -hmm. to those planning board comments. Okay, so, so I can bomb page five. Yeah, um, I just, I would I change, change, that one, that. change that one with, with the zoning board comments. And then um, I don't remember if the planning board actually talked about snow storage or not, but I, I know we did. So I that's what I would. I'll have to review the comments, but I'm pretty yeah. sure that Craig brought it up. I don't think it was something the planning board discussed. Yeah, I know that I brought it up too. So, mm -hmm. yep. All right. Anyway, I just want to make sure we have the right reference for the right body. Mm -hmm. So I would, I guess I would move that we amend it to uh, reflect accurately the, um, the comments made by Zona. Uh, the Mr. Mr. Chair, I believe, um, yeah. I mean, to interrupt you, but I think Hilda has her hand up. She might have some comments for the minutes. I yep. had sent you some. Did you find them? I did, Hilda. And I think it was a, you sent me like a few emails. I, I couldn't tell which set of minutes it pertained to. So would you mind, oh, oh, I guess oh, during the. But I marked it. I'm sorry. All right. Well, one That's of them okay. is on page five. Yep. And I'm questioning uh, line five down. Talking, uh, Jessica Allen answered that. What was proposed was the maximum if what they are comfortable with or is what they are comfortable with. That okay. If, is that an IF or an IS? Um, so, you said page five. Which paragraph that, was that again? I'm sorry. The, line five. Yeah, it, it says, Chair Steve Judge asked how Val Valley CDC decided on the lighting plan. And the next line, what was proposed was the maximum if what they are comfortable with as a dime or is is a verb. It's gross, Max, uh, is what... it's it's okay, yeah. Thing, I think it is. No, no, it's it should be is. You're right. Um, let me take note of that. Okay. And um, um, I had comments on uh, page two. No. Three. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Page three. Um, I'm the quoting me, which is one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. It says the biggest liability to them will be absorbing moisture to come to that they will high salt. Something is missing there. Which is under Hilda Greenbaum, one, mm -hmm. two, three, four, five, line five. The biggest liability to them will be absorbing moisture to counter that they will high, so it does not. Oh, you know, I remember this discussion. It was, they'll, I think they're four to six inches above the ground, so it doesn't, the water is not splashing up on it. So I think you need, you just, there will Something's be. Something's missing in that sentence. I don't know I, what it is. Yeah, I remember the discussion. It was just, if I remember correctly, I think it was going to be six inches above the, um, the level of the, of the ground so it does not have water splashing upon it. Does that comport with your recollection, Ms. Greenbaum? Well, I'm just concerned with the sentence doesn't make sense. Okay, well, I think, we've, I think we've fixed the sentence because there's a, a, there's a number of inches above the level that that's, that is what we were talking about here. Is it the word enough to counter that they will be high enough? That would be fine. Is that what the that, Yeah. They will be yeah. high enough so it does not have water splashing. That'd be great. And we don't have to go back and look And then it. the just... other thing on that same page, I have no idea what ERV is. I think you better spell it out. Same page, uh, ERV. Okay. Same, um, the next, next paragraph. It's possible that they have higher humidity and the ERV can be used to control. Well, I don't know what ERV is. Which means somebody reading it 40 years from now won't either. Yeah, it's, okay. a, it's ERV. It, spell it out, but it's, a, um, like a, it's an air exchanger. ERV. Okay. Yeah, I can elaborate and spell that one out. Um, I'm not sure what that is off the top of my head, but I'll have to look into it. Good. I'm glad it's not me. <laughs> All right. 
If there, are there any other changes to these minutes? I think I think that's it. If I not, had written that ahead, to, but I guess he didn't know what I was talking about. All right, so you don't have any other changes, right, Ms. Greenbaum? I don't. I'm just looking at one page, but I can't get it open. All right. Um, I think that. No, I think you've got them all. Okay. Um, um, would not be able to meet their hers on page um four. I think you better spell that out three times. Hers, H E R. It's in capital, so you should find it three times on page four. You better, you better. Fill in what that those letters are. Okay. Thank it's you, some, have some kind of a rating system, but nobody's going to know what that is. Mm -hmm. that, I think that's a. Okay. And I would entertain a motion that we accept the, the minutes with the following amendments that we insert the word enough on. Um, the fourth paragraph on page three that we spell out ERV, that um, hers rating is defined and then uh, you can, at least the first usage, um, and that we correct the planning board reference in some places where it should be zoning board of appeals members reference. Uh, and with that, approve the minutes with those amendments. Do I have some? So is there a second? Hi, Mr. Chair. All right, it's moved and seconded. Any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes as with amendments. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Aye. The vote is five to nothing. The minutes are approved. The next order of business is the minutes, the consideration of the minutes from the Thursday, December 7th, 2023. Uh, meeting. Again, are there any corrections or uh, concerns ex which that members have regarding these minutes? I got another one um, on the second page. O and M plan. I have no idea what that is. Operations and management plan. But I can elaborate on that. Uh, operations and maintenance. Maintenance. maintenance, my bad. maintenance yeah. <laughs> This is for operation. Is this for the stormwater? Yeah, operations and maintenance. You're correct. Was that the only um, comment you had, Hilda? Unless I send it to you, I think so. Okay. The only thing I got marked here. Yeah, that's the only thing I could see from um, O and M. That's the the only note that I noticed that you sent to me in your email regarding the December seventh minutes. All right, if there, unless there are any other uh, suggested changes, I'd entertain a motion that we approve the minutes as amended by spelling out o, uh, by spelling out the meaning of O and M on the last line of the second page. Do I have such a motion? So, so moved. And second? We got it, we have two. Yeah, All right, second. motion is moved and seconded. Any discussion? The vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. The vote is five to nothing. The amendments as am the minutes as amended are approved. The next order of business is a public hearing on ZBA 2024-03 Valley Community Development Corporation request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B to construct 30 occupied affordable res residential units located on a 15 located in 15 duplex structures. Um, this, this is continued from January 4th, 2024. Uh, so are there any disclosures from any members on the board? I want to go through the submissions. We've had several submissions in the last several weeks. They're all contained in the project the draft project application report, which you've received, and they're outlined in red. We have an update on the stormwater pollution prevention plan, dated 1-17-24. We have a new stormwater operations and maintenance plan, 
prepared by Stonefield Engineering, dated, um, updated 1-17-2024. We have updated site plans. The dates are all January 1st, or January 17th, 2024, and those include C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, C8, C9, C10, all various site plans and drawings. And we have an ANP, or an approval not required plan of land prepared by Gary Holdright, PLS, dated 129, 2024. I think those are the entire submissions, new submissions that we've had since the last meeting. And there are no public comments that I'm aware of. Are there, Rob? Not that I'm aware of, Mr. Chair. I think people uh, got tired of submitting public comments to us. <laughs> um, I think the All last right. one we received was back in November. Got it. OK. So um, proceeding to the, the application before us. You know, we're not going to be able to complete this tonight. Um, there's still some work that has to be done. The Conservation Commission has to consider this. They've got to review the project. I think there's some other issues that there may be other issues that have to be resolved, um, ANP and a few other things. But we can make some progress toward our goal um, and probably get into some of the conditions tonight. Um, but I would propose the following sort of order of work this evening. The first is to update uh, the, the applicant petitioner can provide us an update on their waiver requests. We have an updated waiver request, um, and we have the um, that was given to us, and we may want to run through. We do want to run through that. I think we should discuss the plan for the abutting house, which is um, I think the staff should probably discuss where we are on that. The status of the agricultural property at 94, uh, 96 Summer Street that may be still up in the air, but at least we should know where, where we stand on that. An update on the, uh, the Conservation Commission's consideration. And uh, Ms. Allen, I think you can, uh, along with other parts of this, you can give us an update on that. And then I'm going to ask Carolyn Murray just to describe the decision document that she prepared um, and produced. It's a really helpful template by which we can um, deliberately go through the things we have to consider. And I think it lays out the issues pretty well. I'm not going to have her run through the whole thing, just describe it for us and talk about its purpose and its function. Then we'll go into the details of the, you know, the conditions and the findings and everything else, but just to, to run through it would be helpful, Ms. Murray. Um, May I? And, yes, Mr. Wachell. I think Mr. Henry wanted to say something first, and I'll go after. Thank, thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask if we also have time, if we can just do a high-level overview of the lottery document, just so I can understand it. We're, uh, we're going to get to that. Yep. That's on okay. my list. Yep, absolutely. Before we start to consider the conditions, I want to have a discussion. The next thing I was going to say is yeah. we're going to have a discussion about local preference and any other issues that people think are critical and large issues uh, that we need to discuss. So indeed, we do want to discuss local preference and that lottery sheet that we had in our packet. Uh, that's what I think you're referring to, Mr. Henry. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And then a public comment before we start to vote and consider conditions. All right. So that's my order of business, and I think we can get through some of this. I do want to just a second, Rob. I do want to let everybody know we'll take a five-minute break at seven thirty, and we'll and we will complete our deliberations tonight at nine. And so as far as we've gotten, because there is no hope of getting it all done tonight, so we want to keep to a reasonable amount of time. So that's the order of business tonight. And Rob, you had something you wanted to say. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify um, your second item regarding the, the plan of the house next door or the house on the property. So that is a approval not required plan of land. Um, essentially, they have to submit that in order to section off that house onto its own parcel. Mm -hmm. um, the plans are finalized and have been submitted to town staff for us to include in the board's packet, but um, they can't officially follow them until the chair of the zoning board signs off them after the comprehensive permit has been granted. So I just wanted to, to clarify that for the board, um, for those in attendance. And of course, if you wanted the applicant to present that plan, Mr. Chair, um, just briefly showing us screen share uh, what mm -hmm. it looks like, uh, I guess board members can comment on it, um, up to you. Yeah, that would be helpful just to, so we all know what's going on. Yep. All right, so I think the first order of business then is to discuss the waivers and Ms. Allen, um, I think you're the probably the right person 
are you the right person to go through this or did you you've been working on this along with Ms. Murray and the town staff? Yes, I think town staff had the last um take at it. So we yeah. provided um changes that had been discussed at a meeting between town staff and uh Valley. Um, all of those have been incorporated and sent back to Ms. Murray. So um I think she had her last fingers on it. So um, I'm happy to walk through it, but um, it, it either or, it doesn't matter. So I let's do this. First of all, give me your name and address for the record. Ms. Sure. Allen, sorry. Sure. Jessica yeah. Allen, uh, Valley Community Development, Northampton. All right. So mo many of these are pretty much self-explanatory and absolutely required in order to proceed with the, the project. There are some that are um, that need some clarification in some of the more recent ones. Carol um, Murray, mm -hmm. can you just highlight the uh, waiver requests um, that we should focus on? I don't think we need to go through. We're not going to vote on this because we need to have. Um, there still has to be some additional questions answered, if I am correct, about the um, about some of the waivers. So we, that won't be voted on today until later. So I, I think we should just go through some of the, the changes or the, or the ones that are most important, if you uh, agree. And Certainly. I'd love it for you to do that. Certainly, Mr. Chair. Um, and, and thank you to Rob for pulling it up on the screen. Um, I think the first one that bears some discussion is the one that's highlighted at the bottom of um, page one in front of you with respect to the buffer from um, you know some surrounding land in you know farmland or adjacent farmland, um, and as you can see, we had hold until there was a field verification by the town. Um, I know, Mr. Chair, this is one of the items you just listed sure. as something you wish to discuss uh, later this evening. I don't know if you want to discuss that aspect now or just run through the waivers now, and and we come back to. Uh, I don't, you know, I think it's probably, let's just do it right now and knock it off. I don't think it's going to take a long time to just, to describe it. And we can just, just discuss it, uh, the status of that property on 9496 Summer Street. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Um, okay. So me and Ms. Brushup actually went to um, the properties in question or reviewed them from Valley's property earlier today. Um, and I guess, Chris, did you want to give the update first or did you want me to do it? Well, um, I wouldn't mind giving the update. Uh, so Rob and I visited the site and um, observed that it appeared that there was that there had been farming on 9496 Summer Street. So um, we don't believe there's active farming there now, but you might as well leave it in in case um, active farming resumes sometime before the buildings are built. Um, we did also observe that it appears that there's active farming on two adjacent parcels, but only one of them is within 150 feet of the uh, parcel that Valley CDC is working on. And that would be um, parcel 5B-160, which is located at 87 Mill Street. So my recommendation would be to add um, 87 Mill Street to this um, waiver request. Yeah. In the active uh, farming operation that we observed looked like um, a field that was used for growing hay, but it's definitely in that cycle of where, um, you know, it's just not being used and might be used again in the spring potentially. So that's why it'd be wise to include this waiver in, in the um, official decision document. All right. Um, let's go to the next page. So this is the ANR provision, also a topic that we're going to discuss. Um, we might as well discuss it now, Rob and, and, and Ms. Brushed up. Be, let's talk about that and, and what whether we need to have a waiver for that so, or not. Mr. Chair, did you want us to uh, yeah, show the plans too? Yeah, or, let's show the okay. plans. Let's, let's just deal, deal with it. All right, just give me one second. All right, should be shown now. Here it is. 
Uh, so here's your standard A and R plan. The lot that they are separating is down here. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see it. Um, my apologies for trying to find the controls. All right, so right here, this is the lot that they're gonna create, proposed lot B. And uh, I believe, just for my own sake, uh, this is gonna be considered a flag lot. Am I correct on that? Yes, okay. So they're basically creating a flag lot here. So I just wanna note that, um, Jessica, did you include a waiver from the flag lot provisions of the zoning bylaw for this? Yes, it's already okay. in there, I believe. Okay, yes. good. So the one thing, Mr. Chair, that <laughs> is very important to this is this portion over here. So usually for any a &R plan, so it's abbreviated as approval not required under the subdivision control law, um, essentially the usually it goes to the planning board and the planning board reviews it. And then afterwards the members vote to determine whether or not this specific plan of land requires approval through the subdivision control process. Usually when they vote, that means it doesn't require that. So that's why it's called approval not required. Um, usually the chair of the planning board signs in the section over here, and that's the only person who has to sign it. And then after that, the petitioner would file it with the, app, with the uh, registry of deeds, and it becomes an official plan of land recorded. So in this case, this paragraph down here was inserted by um, at the request of attorney Murray to indicate that since this is part of a 40B permit, the chair of the zoning board and the zoning board could technically approve this plan and have it sent forward to the registry of deeds for Ms. Allen and Valley CDC to record. So they can section off this property that has the existing building and sell to whoever wants to buy it. So that's pretty much the gist of the a and plan. Um, I don't know if anybody else wanted to chime in if I'm missing something, but that's that's pretty much the reason why we're listing that as a as a waiver. And Mr. Chair, if I could just add to that, when we first started talking about the a and plan, you might recall um, that I'd indicated there was an, a pending superior court case at that time um, that would decide whether or not the zoning board can in fact act in place of the planning board under the subdivision control law. It was very convenient of the court to issue a decision in January on that matter, confirming that yes, the zoning board in the 48 context does act on behalf of the planning board with respect to subdivisions related to that 40B. So I'm comfortable with the uh, zoning board endorsing the plan as shown. Great, thank you. All right, in the next um, waiver that is highlighted in our um, in these waivers as the uh, dimensional regulations, uh, we're trying, I think we're trying to figure out whether it's needed or not. Um, building coverage is, uh, I think that, I think it's Ms. Allen's comment that building coverage is only 7%. Um, walk us through the, whether you need this waiver or not. Would you, Ms. Allen? I don't believe that we do. Um, okay. These numbers were calculated by the civil team. Um, and so um, building coverage at 7%, the zoning requires a maximum of 10. So we're under um, under the maximum by three percentage. So the buildings and um, that's not going to change at all in any revised site plans that are going to be done. So. All right. And so I don't know that we need to have, this could be deleted from future uh, versions of the waiver request. Correct. Ms. Greenbaum? Yeah, um, we talked about that community space, um, the set aside, the, the, the uh, owners will decide what they want to do with it. If they build something on that space, will we need this or not? Will that still be under the 10%? Well, I think there's two questions, Ms. Greenbaum. The first is, we it would be pretty large building if it was, it would be almost half as much square footage as all the buildings, the 30, the 15 buildings they have. So it may, it'd have to be an awfully big community center or other structure to trip the 10% to number. Um, but if it does, it would have to come either get a waiver or come back to the, the ZBA for approval. But I think that, um, I think the answer is, it is not on a plan now, um, and I don't know why we would accommodate that, with, which is not on a plan, and I think it's unlikely that a community building would have as much as half of the 
square footage of all the other buildings um, with site coverage already. Okay, I just wanted, yep. to, wanted to leave it in just in case down the line they want to do something. I don't. I don't think we should waive some. I, it seems to me it's probably not harmful to do it, but also at the same time, um, there's, I don't think there's a need to do it. Okay. All right. Are there any other questions regarding waivers? And then waivers will consider um, the next time we meet when these are all completed. We have a, a fresh copy before us, but we'll go back to waivers at a later at the next meeting when we um, do, hopefully are looking at final considerations. So we've gone through the waiver requests. We've talked about the ANR plan for the abutting house. Uh, yes, Rob. I was going to ask for clarification, Mr. Chair. Um, did you want the applicant to um, update the waivers and then resubmit to us prior to the next meeting? Well, yeah. I, okay. If it's us, either the staff or the, the applicant, I think the applicant is probably the best person to do it. Okay. Yeah, it's the applicants uh, who originally created the documents. So if they want to update it um, and send to us, they definitely could. And so, Miss Allen, um, unless you feel a need to have that ten percent waiver there, I don't. I don't see a need for it. Um, you can delete it. You can come back with your suggestions for the board for the next meeting. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. We talked about the waivers. We talked about the A and R. We did the agricultural property. Um, information on both 94 and 96, as well as the amendment needed for 80, I guess that's number eight, 87 Mill Street. Um, can we get an update on the CONCOM's consideration of this project and what the issues are before that and, and the timing, your idea of timing? If they sure. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so after uh, the last set of plans that you actually have in your board packet were submitted, the civil team determined that there were um, the results from two test pits that were conducted in the proposed infiltration basin area. The groundwater was higher than the basin could be designed for. And so we've been working over the past couple of weeks to modify the stormwater basin design to accommodate that high groundwater. Um, it's been trickier than we anticipated because of the wetland buffers, because of the site constraints with the trees that are there that we're trying to protect. So it's been a little bit tricky trying to make the basin work and make the numbers work. Um, so the um, civil team is committed to submitting a revised set of plans to the Conservation Commission by the 21st. Um, I, we are scheduled to be continued to the Conservation Commission on the 28th. The stormwater basin design is probably substantial enough that it's going to end up going into two meetings with the Conservation Commission is my guess. Um, so I suspect that if we are continued in the order of conditions has um, needs to be modified, amended. Um, we also have an O&M plan and um, a stormwater management plan that are also being updated with the correct data. So all of those documents need to get updated and resubmitted. Um, and then the town has to have the ability to have time to review. So I suspect that we will hopefully, fingers crossed, hopefully I'll go on a plan that will be done with the CONCOM by the 13th of March. Okay. All right. So, yeah, and there's no other modifications to the site plan, just to be clear, it's really the stormwater system that's that's undergoing changes right now. All right. So I think we can hold questions off on um, the stormwater plan until the it's all we get the new modified plan. All right. Are there any other updates that you want to provide to us, Ms. Allen or Ms. Murray or staff, uh, or any other follow-ups that people have questions that people have had? Other than I think the big major issues we're going to talk about um, local preference and anything else, the big issues, but. Are there any other follow-ups or any other um, um, modifications that you or that you wish to um, us tell the board about? Um, no, the the big one was the site plan, so that's the thing that's really driving my stress levels right now. <laughs> um, so uh, we hope to get that buttoned up pretty soon. Miss Brestrup, I see your hands up. So a couple of things. One is. Um, we mentioned the site plan and we need to have a site plan that is um, attached to this decision when it gets recorded. So um, will you also be um, updating that 
uh, that side plane, which I think is S4 or C4 or something like that. It's a site plan of the whole site. So you'll be making sure that that plan is updated along with all the other plans. Okay. You're muted. You're muted. Yep. But I think that's yes. an affirmative answer. Sorry about so am I beyond now? Okay. Good. Yes. Uh yes, the whole set is going to be updated. Okay. And then um are you going to go through all of these um items in the decision or is this an opportunity to bring up things that we have found in the decision? Um, I, this is a great up. I, what I, if there are issues that are not part of the conditions, this is a time to bring them up. If there are issues, we, my intention tonight is to try to get to con eventually get to conditions and go through some of those and perhaps vote on some of the some portion of those conditions. But if there are other items in the decision document that you think we should talk about, um, I would be open to doing that. What I don't want to do, Chris, though, is I don't want to go through all the findings yet. I want to do conditions first, because that's how I make that's how, how I think we should make decisions about findings. Once we do the conditions, we can say that we've made these findings. So mm -hmm. I don't want to go through findings right now. I think it'd be uh, something we do at a later point in time. OK, well, there is one thing that came up that mm -hmm. we were puzzling about, and it has right. to do with um, electric vehicle charging stations and how the current plan comports with the building code or not. And so we came up with um, a change in wording and it's on page four of the decision document that Ms. Murray has prepared. And it's under item J4. All right, page four, J4. Or J4, so um, where this document says under J4 IV, yeah, um, it says two additional spaces. And we discussed this with Mr. Mora because he is very knowledgeable about the issues here. And he suggested just leaving out the word two and saying capital A additional spaces at each parking area will be required for future electric vehicle charging stations. So just take out the word two and uh, change the first A in additional to a capital A, and that seems to solve the problem. And that provides that there will be, since the spaces is plural, that provides that there will be at least two and gives the flexibility for there to be more if that's the decision in the future. Is that right? That's correct. Mr. Chair, I, I think this topic actually warrants a little bit of discussion because right. the, the building code is um, hasn't caught up with kind of reality in a little bit. Um, and so I don't know if you want to discuss it now or whether you want to discuss it when we get into conditions, because it's also listed in conditions. And I'm happy to wait if that's your preference. What I think we should do is this is one of the issues that is a, is a, sounds like it's a large issue that we want to have a discussion about when we get to to that after Ms. Murray just talks about the uh, the decision document. So we'll do local preference. We will have EV, a discussion regarding EV spaces um, before we go into conditions and anything else that's a major issue, uh, either on conditions that people want to talk about. But I think it's good to bring it up separate from the condition itself, because we may not get to condition that far on the conditions tonight, but we, it's an issue that we should deal with. All right. Ms. Greenbaum. Are we going to go through this? Uh decision line by line at some point because I got questions of here and there. Yes, we'll be we'll be going through it, but tonight we're not going to go through it line by line. We're going to go through we're going to do the conditions. We're not going to do the findings until we've also already made our conditions known because that's how we in many cases that's how you can make your findings is that it's based on the conditions that you have uh, agreed upon. We will be going through it um, to the, to whatever to the greatest extent People want to go through it. We will do that. Yeah, the things I don't understand, I underline, but I'll wait on it. We'll see what happens. All right. We'll get through it. Okay. So, Ms. Mer, are, are there any other things that people think they want to put on the agenda for topics for tonight? All right. Ms. Murray, do you want to go through and just describe the, the purpose of this, the decision document? the purpose of it and how uh, you intended for us to guide our conversations. 
Certainly, Mr. Chair. Uh, so the the draft decision that is before you is actually based on, I believe, the the most recent 40B project that uh, your board has approved. So we figured that the format would mm -hmm. be something that should be familiar to uh, to most of you, if not all of you. Um, I won't go through it line by line because we're going to do that at a later date. But right. essentially, you know, the you see the key elements. There being, you know, some uh, some uh, you know background that is provided, um, some information that really goes to the heart of 40B and the regulations of, you know, what does it mean to be consistent with local needs, especially where Amherst is at um, a safe harbor with the 10 percent, and um, also based in these first few pages. Um, there are some findings, which I know we're not going to discuss tonight. Um, I, I just want to make it clear that these are findings that are purely speculative on my part. You know, this is clearly a decision that remains with the board. But mm -hmm. as we go through materials and try to describe the project and make it clear, not just for all of us who've been through the process, but for uh, those who will succeed us, uh, you know, 10 years from now, they should be able to pick up this document and read through it and understand exactly uh, what the board's rationale was and exactly what was proposed and the relief that was granted, et cetera. Um, but I don't want anyone to um, be particularly exercised at this point about any of the findings because this was really just um, my speculation as to where the board might go with respect to some of these findings at this time. Um, the next uh, key portion of the decision um, is really listing all of the plans that have been submitted because we, we will refer to the approved plan set. And uh, I can't tell you how often that leads to a question, especially by a building commissioner after the fact who says, well, what is the approved plan set? So we're constantly updating uh, the plan set and any other submissions so that it can be clear what was the record before the board. Yep. And as as Christine mentioned, um, it's uh, it's plan C4, the site plan, that when that is finalized, that will actually be attached as exhibit A to your decision and it will get recorded at the registry of deeds. So that again, the members of the public can be clear as to what it is that the board has done. Um, the next section really gets to the heart of conditions. Um, and then I, I won't, I know we're gonna go through those in some more detail. Again, some of the conditions, these are things that, some of them are fairly standard from prior decisions. Some of them are unique to this particular project. Um, Again, this is a little bit of folks like me, Christine, Rob, uh, even Jessica and Rebecca, uh, pulling out our crystal balls based on notes that we've been taking throughout the proceedings or comments or concerns that the board has raised and trying to formulate some conditions that we think the board might want to consider. But again, nothing is finalized at this point. And then really the last sections be that are um, important are obviously the board's final vote, which will just be a majority vote. And then um, the waivers, which um, we will obviously have an updated waiver list for you in time for the board's next meeting. Um, right. If I could just for on a procedural note, um, and it looks like perhaps we might have lost Mr. Meadows for a moment. Um, Mr. Meadows uh, was absent from your last hearing in January. There he is. Um, so it will be necessary that in order for him to actually vote on this particular project, um, Mr. Meadows will have to go through, uh, you know, all of the materials that were submitted and complete a certification that we have to read into the record um, at your next meeting, or at least before the board votes on this matter. So. Um, with that, Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll stop and, and you can tell me how you'd like to proceed. One clarification, pending that, he can still vote on um, matters considered to, by the board tonight. Um, he doesn't have to file that. That, that is for the final. The restriction on his ability to vote 
pending the uh, submission of that um, um, document saying that he's reviewed the other other items is on final passage. It's not on the inter intermittent motion, such as to approve a condition or not. Is that correct? I, I would feel more comfortable, Mr. Chair, if actually that, that certification was in because to the extent that um, one of those conditions somehow or other relates back to a discussion that we had at the January hearing, uh, we wouldn't want someone to call that into question. Um, but you only need a majority vote. Right, so, we only need three. Right. For, for everything. So yeah. I'm not suggesting that, you know, if Mr. Meadows, if you take votes tonight on conditions and if Mr. Meadows wants to vote, I, I'm not going to discourage him from participating in that vote. Um, I think it'll only become critical if the vote is three to two with Mr. Meadows on the prevailing side. Yeah, right. Okay. Hopefully we'll have five O votes on everything. That's my goal. All right. And I know uh, Mr. Meadows will uh, complete that uh, documentation and review the material. Um, all right. So I think, first of all, thank you, Ms. Murray, for putting this together. I think it's really helpful. Uh, it does outline the work we have to do, and it lays out the questions in a good way. So and I, I do recognize the format from the last 40B that we did for the, the um, affordable housing, the rental housing on, uh, on Route 9. All right. Um, so I guess what I'd like to do is, is move. Mr. To Chair, before you move on, I'm sorry, I have a question. Yep. Yes, Mr. Henry. So the document um, is heavily redlined. When do we get a clean version or is that by design as we decide um, it comes clean based on what we decide? Well, I, my preference is what you're seeing is the, the, the changes. And I thought, I think it's helpful to see the changes that are made. Um, and then and I seems to me that we can read the 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 document as intended as amended by the red line but it, is it something that you find um to do you find it difficult to see what the final res proposed result or condition is without with all the red line material in it i, I do prefer if there weren't the red lines in there because if i'm under, if i understood correctly we're just walking through something that was previously used to match what we're doing now Well, you know, I think what we're doing is showing the changes from the previous versions and how um, I think it's been principally the petitioner and the staff and Ms. Murray have walked through the conditions. And I thought that was help. I think that's helpful just to see how they've uh, been changed over time. Um, so the most part but, of my if, if you're, if, but I, you know, if you can't, if you're having a hard time understanding the conditions as redlined, that's not an optimal situation for you or for the board members. Um, so I would ha ask maybe Ms. Brestrup to just respond to that. And if um, perhaps through, perhaps for tonight, we can see if we can go through these conditions, uh, some set of these conditions with a des description of the changes and see if that so solves your problem. And then the next time we can create, I think it's just by a click of a, of a, a, a mouse, you can create a, a modif as modified version of these uh, conditions. And we can have that available for the next meeting. But I don't want to make, I don't want to put you at a disadvantage, Mr. Henry. Uh, no, so I, I don't think it's necessary that um, anyone do anything, any additional work, so to speak. My question was, do we accept the changes as we go? Oh, um, to show that we voted on these conditions and we're accepting them. Is this like a work and living document? We work in it as we go. Right. So when we go through these conditions, we will accept them or we can accept them, assuming that they, we like the version, the board likes the version of condition one with or condition two with the uh, changes in it. We would adopt that condition as modified and shown here on the, on the sheet. So that, and then okay. That's what we would do. Yes. So, so that, so that is fine. Okay. No, that was, my, that was my question. So yeah, it, it is fine the way it is. Yes. I gave you a long answer, probably longer than yeah. it needs. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> yeah. But Ms. Brestrup has his hand up and I always want to hear what she has to say. 
Well, I just wondered if that meant that you were going to do real-time edits, and I'm kind of like leery about that. I think what we should do is talk about each thing and maybe as a whole decide whether you want to go along with each thing, and then Ms. Murray will um, make the changes to the document that she's been working on. She's kind of like the point person for this document, and I don't want to be um, confused about what changes were made and when. So if we can agree as a whole that, yes, this change is correct, then Ms. Murray can produce the next set of, of uh, the document with those changes in them. And Rob and I can actually work on providing both a clean copy and a redlined copy to you for your next meeting. So if it's easier for you to read the clean copy, we can provide both. But I, I just don't want to lose track of where we are and Ms. Murray is kind of in charge of this document. So thank you. So um, then if, if that makes sense, Ms. Brestro, and then we would, what I would suggest the, as a change in process here is what we should do is go through here and tentatively approve or amend or reject uh, some subset of these conditions as far as we get tonight, some subset. Um, pending us coming back the next meeting, seeing the, the, um, the full version as amended by our um, proposed uh, action tonight, and then approving them in block later on. But I think we could do a, I'd like to start moving on these conditions, and I'd like to at least have a, um, a tentative approval on as much as we can do tonight. Then we can look at the version as amended, both of the red line version and the final version next week and improve in, in block if indeed it represents the consensus or the majority of the board. Does that make sense to everybody? I, I have yes. one question. But, but just a second, just a second. Mr. Baum. Does, does that, you understand, Chris, does that make sense? And that's, and Ms. Murray, does that make sense too as well for, to do it that way? Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes, Ms. Greenbaum. Yes, Chris answered just about everything that I I wanted to say, but um, I can't read the font this small, so I'm hoping that the clean copy will be at least a ten point font because this this looks like two or three, and it's a real eye strain. I can't read it with all. So if at least the clean copy can be, and if this can be slightly bigger font, it would help to the red so line. Um, Hilda, the reason why the font's smaller is because that document has comments on the side. I know. That's yeah. why I said clean copy. So take those out. Go back to normal. So we'll definitely, uh, Mr. Chair, we'll definitely have a clean copy prepared as well for the next right. meeting. You just do accept all changes. And <laughs> we'll, have a large, we'll have a large document. It's not, it's, it won't be hard to do. All right. All right. So then what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go through as many of these conditions as we can. We're, and when we get to that, we're going to go through as many conditions as we can. We'll take the, uh, the uh, tentative approval, disapproval, or amendment of these conditions and move on, ask Ms. Murray and the staff to incorporate those dis tentative decisions, and we'll vote upon the considered uh, conditions in our next meeting. All right? Good. Okay. So before we get to conditions, which we've now... Uh, we understand how we're going to proceed on conditions. What I'd like to do is have a discussion on a couple of things. I'd like to have a discussion about local preference and the chart and the lottery, as Mr. Henry has said. I'd also like to have a discussion, I think, about EVs. We had talked about that as well, and those two things. So I, what I would like to do is have um, a, a discussion on the chart that I think you provided, Ms. Allen, on local preference and the lottery and how local preference affects the, the extent to which local preference is applicable to this project, which I think is 10 out of the 30 units. And I think it's just, I think local preference just affects the, um, well, you're gonna have to tell me because that's what I'm confused about. Which units it affects either 80 or 100% and how it affects it. So that, mm -hmm. and we, I'd like to have a discussion in general about uh, the local preference and see what board members are. Sure. So, Alan, okay. take it away. So um, this was per the request of the planning department. They asked for something that might be a little bit more graphic to help um, simplify a very complicated topic. And 
I will tell you that I went through probably five versions before I felt like I had something that was simple enough. And I think it's probably still complicated. So yep. um, I think it's a, this is a complicated topic. It's a complicated thing to try to explain. So I'm going to try to do my best. Um, the way that this is set up is that um, the I tried to color code it. So as we discussed previously, the first priority is for appropriately sized households. Ms. Allen, before you go any farther, I, I, sure. don't want to, I don't want to interrupt you unnecessarily. Local preference applies to 80 or 100%. Which one? It, it would apply to the entire project. The entire project. Okay. All right. Um, so the first priority is for appropriately sized households. Um, that is the priority that's set by mass housing for home ownership. This really is to make sure that we're not um, under housing people, that we don't have like a, a single person living in a three bedroom house when we have such a shortage of affordable housing. So um, this is defined under the mass housing guidelines as a household with a number of members equal to the number of bedrooms plus one. So for instance, in any of the two bedroom homes in this development, this would be a minimum of a three person household. And for any of the three bedroom homes, this would be a minimum of four people. So um, that is the first and highest priority in terms of the lottery process. The second priority would be for disproportionately impacted households or DIH as I've abbreviated on here. And this is defined under the ARPA legislation. We've discussed this a number of times in previous meetings, and it's been well-defined in the other local preference memos that I provided the board. Um, so as Mass Housing has basically explained to me is that what they're seeing is that most, most households that are qualifying for DIH and the Commonwealth Builders Program are those that are geographically located. So people that are living in a qualified census tract. As we've discussed and as we've um, shown in previous meetings, there are two qualified census tracts in Amherst. One is in the North Amherst area, and then there's another one that's just south. Um, so that would be the second priority in terms of the lottery process and how households are selected. If the town were to condition for local preference, local preference would then be the third priority. Um, and so I have color coded, first priority is green, Second priority of the DIH is blue and third priority is yellow. So what I've created is sort of a fictitious lottery here with people that don't really exist um, that I've made up out of my head. <laughs> and so under this example, there are six homes that are available for the lottery and we have 12 households that are applying for it. Um, so it's kind of a, a two to one in, a, in a terms of the lottery. So what you'll see is that households um, if you don't have any local preference, and even if you do, households that either have a green or a blue tend to rise up. They're the highest priority. So they're going to be at the top of the, of the lottery selection process. If you have none of these items, you're going to be at the bottom of the lottery process. So for instance, household one, it meets DIH. They live in Amherst. They meet local preference because they lived in the qualified census tract, um, or they meet they meet local they meet the DIH because they live in a qualified census tract. They meet local preference because they live in Amherst. Um, because they don't have that top priority, first priority green, they don't necessarily make the cut in this fake lottery process that I've created. In the local preference world, they would um, come under tier five. If you recall, we talked about the the process is tiered, it's not necessarily pools. So um, local preference is a tier five out of eight. Um, with no local preference, they're tier three out of four. So household two meets the household size. They live in a QCT. They happen to live in Greenfield. With no local preference, they're in the first tier that's selected. With local preference, they're in the second tier that's, that's selected. Household number three, they um, meet the first priority. They do not meet DIH. They live in Amherst, so they meet local preference. Um, in this instance, if there's no local preference, they would be in the second tier. If they were with local preference, they would be in the third tier and they would be selected. Do you see how this, this works? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, 
do you want me to go through the whole chart or do you basically sort of understand the the process of how this works? I can continue, but I just don't want to. I, I think it's helpful to just run through. Sure. How... Okay. I can absolutely continue. Um, I just didn't want to waste the board's time going through it unless they, unless you really wanted me to absolutely go through it, which I'm happy to do. It's helping um, me. So where am I at? Household four? <laughs> I've lost yeah. track already. You're on four. Um, Okay, so there are three person house in a, looking for a two bedroom. So they meet the household size. They live um, in where? They live in a QCT. They do not meet local preference, but because they are they have a green and a blue, they rise to the top. And so if there's no local, local preference, they'd be in the first tier. If there is local preference, they would end up being in the second tier. They would still be selected. Uh, household five has a green and a blue. They live in Springfield. Because they have a green and the blue in that first column without local preference, they'd be in that first tier. Um, with local preference, they would be in the second tier. Household six does not meet the household size, does not live in a QCT as they live in Hadley, but they work in Amherst. They would not meet, uh, they would not be a selected household because they don't have a green or a blue. So even though they're a local preference and they live in Hadley because they don't have, they're not first or second priority, they would not be a selected household. Um, household seven, they have the correct household size and they live in a QCT. Um, they meet local preference um, because they work in Amherst, they live in Chicopee. Um, and um, without local preference, they'd be in that first tier. And with local preference, they would also be in that first tier. Household eight meets the household size, meets the DIH, um, lives in Holyoke, does not meet local preference. Without local preference, they would be in that first tier. And with local preference, they would be in the second tier. Um, household nine um, does not meet household size, does not live in a QCT, lives in South Hadley, has children in the schools, so their only qualifier is local preference. They are not a selected household. Household 11, um, they meet the household size. They do not live in a QCT and they do not meet local preference. Under the first um, example with no local preference, they would be within tier two. They would be the last home that would be selected again because they are fit within that highest priority category. Um, with local preference, they would not be selected. And then the last example is um, not meeting any of the criteria and would not be selected. Got it. Okay. So it's still, still complicated, but I try to simplify it, it still as best I can. <laughs> but it looks to me like what local preference does is it's a third tier and it may help, it, it helps at the margins it doesn't, it's, you have to meet number one, you have to meet number two and, and to get any benefit from your local preference. Correct. So when it comes right down to it, household size is the most important thing. Correct. Next is uh, living in a qualified census tract or disproportionately impacted household. Those two tend to be the driving factors. Local preference is at the margins um, of, and of a additional filter for Correct. the law. Correct. 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 And then one last question. So this affects if, per se, we use 70%, which is the limit. We can't do it. We can't go any higher than 70%, I understand. If we use 70%, that means this factor, the local preference, would have be in effect for 21 of the 30 units. Is that right? Correct. With um, sort of the side note that we talked about a little bit last meeting is that it's kind of a cap, not a guarantee. Right. So say that we only have um, 10 people that meet first priority, second priority, and third priority. Once those 10 are met, and if there's no other qualified households beyond that, and if um, then the remainder, which would be 12, would go into tier two. So tier those two. lottery slots would go into tier two. And so you you would fulfill your local preference only within tier one. Right. And then if you go into tier two, you still have to meet household size. Correct. All of them, right? Correct. 
you get, and in that case, the dif differential is uh, if you live in the QCT or you meet the uh, disproportionately impacted household standard. Right? Correct. Yep. So it's it's really so the tier, first tier would be appropriately sized household number one, DIH number two, local right. preference number three. Once that once that tier is done and all of the slots have been filled, and it's quite possible that we will have the right amount of applicants to fill the 21, you know, there could be tons of people that apply, but I'm just saying that if it doesn't, if that's not the case, then whatever doesn't get met under that 21 just goes into tier two, and right. that's appropriately sized households in DIH only. Right. Okay. okay. So yeah, 70% is a cap. It's not a promise. Correct. Ms. Greenbaum, you had your hand raised, and then Mr. Meadows. Yeah. I do have my hand raised because I've got a whole bunch of questions and I'm not entirely clear about what she just said either. But, but um, first of all, if you look at the household size, which seems to govern everything that happens in the end, um, say you have a couple who is pregnant, are they, number one, told they can't apply because there are only two people or if it's two people who um, um, young, did the, are they disqualified totally or just pushed No, so, so the definition of appropriately sized households, there are a bunch of um, subcategories within that major definition in the regulations. And one of them is for an expectant mother, you can count that baby as a, a, the number three within the household. Okay, so, but if somebody uh, uh, like two senior citizens, um, do they get dropped farther down the list or are they just eliminated? It depends on who applies for the lottery. So you really go down the tiers and once the tier is filled, once you've filled the slots or you have no more applicants, you can move on to the second tier and then you select out of that tier. And once all the homes have been filled, everybody else gets placed on a wait list. So it's not that they're dropped completely. There is a waitlist proceed, you know, process, and it could end up being that people who are selected are unable to get their financials together in order to purchase a house. And so, if that's the case, they would drop out of the process, and we would select somebody off the waitlist. Okay. And then, lastly, what is a household? You're not allowed to ask marital status. And I guess this comes up because we got the four unrelated by Lauren Amherst, but can three un unrelated people be considered a household? Of well, according to the definition that I pulled out of the regulations, it's a household with a number of members equal to the number of bedrooms plus one. It so doesn't say in there they have to be related. They do have to be related. I, yes or I, no? I can double check in the regulations, but it doesn't. I'm just curious, that. yeah, because it's an issue in this town, but, but uh, you know, if three friends or three three widow, widows get together, you know, and they're not related, would they be allowed to, to get a two bedroom? So I'll look in the regulations. Yep, uh, Ms. Allen's gonna look that up. Ms. Green oh, okay. Ms. Murray, are you also on looking that up? I, I am trying, Mr. Chair, yes. Right. Let's see if we can get an answer to that so we can move on. That's a good question. What's the definition of a household in, in terms of related or unrelated people? I guess just to clarify, you're referring to household under the auspices of the program that governs this, correct? Not Absolutely. just household in general. Okay. Because if you try doing household in general, that'd be a, a wild mess of <laughs> I'm not I don't want to go there. I yeah. just want to, I want to solve one problem at a time and I want to solve this problem regarding this program. And then we'll, well I mean you see widows moving in together in various sure. reports to save money and to have companionship. Sorry, it's going to take me a little bit of time to put my hands on the regulations. I I don't have to have it to that. Okay. All right. So I don't um, want to. I, yeah. Perhaps um, 
while you're doing the presentation, Ms. Allen, while people ask some questions, Ms. Murray might have some time to look at it. Um, let's go on to other questions and we'll make sure to come back to the question of how a household is defined for this program, okay? Let me just write that down. All right, Mr. Meadows, um, you had your hand up. Do you have some questions? Yes, I'm curious about a procedural question. What, what yes. if, and I assume it may be true, what if there are 40 or 50 households that meet all of the conditions? Is it drawing out of a hat? How, how is that handled? Yep. So once we determine that they qualify under that tier and they're placed under their tier categories, then it is the pulling of the hat. And then once the 30s, 30 slots are filled, everybody else remaining would be, all the names would continue to get pill, pilled, pulled, and then placed on a wait list. Thank you. I don't want to move on to other topics while we're, um, I'd like to make sure we deal with the um, uh, local preference in the lottery and any questions that people have about that before we move on to anything else. I can <laughs> ask one more. Have, okay. at, the, at this point, um, have they already gone to the bank and been qualified for a mortgage or does that come after this? So typically, yeah, they would um, they would need to prove that they can qualify for mortgage and that would be submitted as part of the application process. Um, it's pretty simple for somebody to go online. Actually, they can go to a bank website, plug in their information and get a letter. So it's not a huge um, burden to be able to do that. But yes, we would like to be able to see that applicants have that ability before we pull their name. Mr. Henry, I know you also raised the issue of the lottery. Have we been addressing the questions that you uh, were concerned about or, or inquisitive about, or are there other questions that you have regarding the lottery or, or local preference? You have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I don't, I do understand. I don't have any additional questions. Okay, great. Well, so then what we find is for the local preference, it can be as many as 21 units may be, local preference may be applied to at the most. Local preference is third of the three character of the three characteristics. Um, and as we look at, at it here, it looks like local preference really only made a difference in one of the six well, excuse me, one of the two of the 12 examples that you used. It, number 11 was selected. If there is no local preference, a five person household, which does not meet the QCT or DIH, but it met the household size, was selected without local preference in this example. And in household three, which met the size, did not live in a, also did not live in a QCT or was not a disproportionately impacted household, but met local preference living in Amherst. They were selected if local preference was in, uh, involved in their selection process. So it looks, it, but in the other cases, local preference did not make a difference as to whether they were expected or selected or not. They may have been on a higher or lower tier, but they were, the selection was only relevant in those two instance, instances. Is that correct, Ms. Allen? I'm, I'm reading this correctly? Uh, you're, yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so we'll wait for households to come up because I don't want to wait too long while we, while we put our, have people rushing through the regulations of the state of Massachusetts, um, which can be daunting. To say I think, the least. I think I just put my um, fingers on it, but why don't you continue and I will confirm. Double check. Yeah. Yep. Mr. White, you've got your hand up. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, Miss Allen, actually, I just wanted to take this opportunity while you're looking that up to thank you for putting that draft together because I had a lot of questions kind of on the local preference aspect going into this and that really helped me a lot. So thank you. One of the other 
while you still work on that, we're going to go to EV. That was the next item, which I know people wanted to discuss. Um, what was the what is the issue on, in terms of EV electric vehicles that um, was raised uh, that wish that you wish to raise? Is that something that you're concerned about, Mr. Meadows, or, or is that something that you're concerned about, Miss Allen? Um, I have some concerns, and um, I think it'd be good. I don't know if uh, Ms. Bestrup wants to kind of brief first before sure. uh, we kind of talk about our um, what we're thinking on this end. All um, right, Ms. Bestrup, go ahead. And I may need some help from um, Rob Wachilla as well, but my understanding is that the current stretch code of the building code would require that all of the units be capable of having an EV charging station assigned to them that would use their meter to provide electricity for an electric vehicle. Um, and that's an expensive process or an expensive prospect. So um, Ms. Allen has been examining with her team if there's a workaround or if she might be able to, or, or if she understands the rules the same way that we do, if she might be able to apply for a variance with the, um, with the state with regard to that requirement. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, yeah, go ahead. Lacking understanding about that, I looked at this decision and had questions about some of the wording. So I asked Rob Mora, and that's how we came up with the wording that I suggested in the beginning of the meeting. It may not be appropriate. There may be other things that I don't understand. But anyway, that's kind of the gist of it, that Ms. Allen hasn't completely determined how she's going to address this issue, that there's this requirement. And um, we're trying to make the decision flexible enough to accommodate whatever the outcome is. So that's my understanding of the situation. So yeah, to just um, uh, add some more information to that. So the stretch code has two different categories under v EV charging. One is for single family homes and duplexes. And then there's another for all other R um, uses. So any other residential uses. We're in this weird spot because we're not just building a single family house or just building a duplex. We are building a cluster of duplexes with shared parking areas. So the way that the code and the way that we've um, we have been advised by the building commissioner that what it how it translates in terms of like on the ground is that it would require a 50 amp breaker for each house. So that would be 30 50 amp breakers. So instead of having a charging station, which is a pay as you go, the only solution from a design perspective in order for us to meet the stretch code under this is to put a um, like a low guardrail and put a bank of 50 amp breakers on there. And so I think it raises a couple of questions for us. Um, one, if we have common metering for the electricity, this means that everybody is now paying for other people's electric vehicle charging. Two, it's just um, it's just a, a, um, a break, or it's just a, an outlet box. So we would either have to lock those boxes or people could break those boxes and then come in outside the community and plug in and charge. So it's like, it's almost creating a um, creative nuisance. Like it doesn't, the code doesn't make sense to the style of this project. If it was just a single family house and you could put this outlet in your garage, totally makes sense. But for the residential code that we meet under the building code, it doesn't really match with this. So we probably, we could put on the plans, you know, this bank of, of 30 breakers, we could do 16 on one parking lot, 15 on the other. I think it's gonna be a maintenance nightmare. I think it might end up causing headaches for the town, quite frankly, if you have people going in there who don't live in the community and are figuring ways to charge their car. Um, so I think we prefer to apply for a variance um, and able to still do the charging stations because we wanna be able to do that pay as you go. It, it seems really unfair to have all community members have to pay for the electricity charging of just a few electric vehicles. Um, it's just that the code like doesn't match this project. Like this project is, is weird. Um, 
for the stretch code under this category. So um, I'd like to have it so the decision is flexible enough to allow us to be granted a variance. Um, and that's a process that's going to involve the building department. We need to put a packet together. It goes to the state. We're going to need support of the town in order for it to be granted. Um, so I'm not sure how we word it in the in the decision, but this is kind of the sticking point for us right now. Um, just before I get to Rob, so is the stretch code in force now and you're compelled to uh, uh, comply with it, or is the stretch code aspirational? Uh, by the term stretch, it's it's no. The town has adopted the stretch code, so the so municipality decides whether they're going to adopt the stretch it. code from the building code. Amherst has adopted it, so therefore we need to comply with it. Absolutely. My question, and I don't think it, I don't, it doesn't sound like it works, is that because it's a locally adopted regulation, I was wondering whether we could request waivers from it because it's been locally adopted, it's almost like it's a local regulation, but um, it sounded like the building commissioner didn't agree with that, that he he said it was a state code. So that's kind of a, a, a question too, that there could be a variant or a waiver provided if the town saw that this is actually a local regulation, but you know that's something I think uh, attorney Murray needs to think about and hem on a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Okay, he already has an answer, I don't know. <laughs> Mr. Wachilla and then Ms. Murray. I was going to uh, to provide an answer to Jessica and to the rest of the board. I was going to suggest, so usually with our special permits, we started carte blanche for every decision that's been approved by the board. We just have the building commissioner review any sort of changes beforehand, and the building commissioner determines whether or not it warrants further review by the board. So usually um, if it's like a minor change, so say if you're moving a light post like 10 feet to the left, um, he'll just do it administratively as opposed to having it go back to the board. But if it's a bigger change, it would go back to the board for either a public meeting or if it's significant enough to where you would have to amend the permit, amend the permit. Um, so I guess for uh, Attorney Murray, that could be a condition we could explore putting into this uh, comprehensive permit document as well. Um, and the reason why we would do that is to have to prevent somebody from amending the whole permit all over again for something as minor as taking out a, a series of electric charging stations. So um, that's one thing I would suggest. Um, I have not reviewed in depth the most recent decision document, so I'm not sure if that's included as a condition, but we could definitely explore including that. Ms. Murray. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I appreciate, you know, the applicants, um, position that they think the stretch energy code, since it's been adopted by the town and incorporated into the zoning bylaw, um, could arguably be a local bylaw that this board can rule. But really all we've done is incorporate by reference this whole host of requirements from the state building code. Um, so in my opinion, Mr. Chair, it, it is part of the state building code that is not something that this board can waive. Um, to the comments that Mr. Rochello was just describing, um, one of the things that, uh, that I think the building commissioner was expressing was that if we leave the, the condition sort of open, that you know whatever the electric vehicle requirement may be for this project, um, that's simply what will apply. Now, if the applicant seeks a waiver under the building code and that's granted, then you know we will abide by that as part you mean of the state building code. You're yes. representing the yes. state building code. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Meadows. Uh, I, I I just looked it up. Um, Eversource is, is has grants that will pay for the entire cost of wiring for EV charging stations. They also will pay up to 50% of the cost of the EV charging stations. And there are Massachusetts grants that will pay, I believe it's $100,000 per charging station. Yes, So thank you. Yeah, we're, we're definitely yeah. aware of those. The problem is right now the, the code wouldn't require a charging station. It requires a 50 amp breaker. 
that's what the code that, requires. So that, it, you you know, right? But that's part of the wiring. Can, that's part yeah. of wiring. Sure, uh, but I think ultimately the fifty amp breaker is not ideal for this site in terms of long term maintenance. I think in terms of just. I think it's it's better to have a charging station and we would absolutely take advantage of all grant opportunities that are available for that. But as of now, the code doesn't allow us to put in a charging station. We have to put in 50 amp breakers. So um, I don't mean to interject, Mr. Chair, but it sounds like, Ms. Allen, you're definitely considering pursuing the variance route for this provision? Okay. I think so. So I guess you want to set up a meeting at some point with town staff to to discuss that with you or to, to, I guess, provide a strategy to move forward with that? Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's that variance approach would happen after this process mm -hmm. is done, um, yeah. you know, as we get closer to the building permit process. So I guess the question is, you know, what needs to be on the plans? Do we meet the stretch code on the plans? How is the, how is the decision language drafted so that it allows us to do flexibility to switch if we are granted the variance? And if we're not, then we're going to be held to the stretch code and we'll have to put in what's required. It's just like, it's just not ideal. I mean, it really, mm -hmm. I think, complicates a lot of things with the condo association, yeah. um, especially having everybody pay for somebody's electric vehicle charging. Fair point. So should we have a gas fund? Everybody puts money into the gas fund so that everybody's stuff gets paid. Right. So, <laughs> so help me with this, and maybe I'm, I'm just dense. Under what circumstances is everybody paying for a few electric car charges? Is that under the state stretch code? Is that's, that what you mean? We will have, we have one common meter that's dealing with the common electricity. Otherwise, you would have to somehow assign assign spaces, have wiring run from that space to the individual house. Like I it just, I don't understand, like it, the complexity of it is, is in, in the expense to doing that is, you know, crazy. So, um, I mean, that's, you wouldn't be able to individually meter. And that's sort of where the code doesn't meet what our project is, is that the code is like, oh, you have a single family house, you have a garage. Or you have, I understand you know, that part. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so we have a common meter for the lights. Um, we have so anything that's in that parking lot, like the parking lot lighting, okay. is tied to a common meter, which is going to be paid by the condo association fee. Right. I, I I don't have an electric car, but it seems to me one one way is you'd have some kind of a, a card that you would put into the meet into the electric uh, charging station. It would say this is it goes to this account, and it comes in part of your as your electric bill or that's not what happens, huh? Not that I'm aware of. I understand. I don't have electric car, mm -hmm. but my understanding is there's an adapter that you plug into your car that you then plug into this this 50 amp. And then that way you can charge your car. It like translates for it. But I don't think there's a there's a a, a charging process that goes to a car. That's what that's why you have, you know, the charging stations, because those can be controlled by an outside vendor. Right. Ms. Bresto? So uh, what I would suggest is that um, Rob Wachilla and I and Rob Mora meet with Ms. Um, Tybalt and Ms. Murray to, and maybe Jessica Allen, Ms. Allen, to come up with some language that is, um, acknowledges that the ZBA would really like there to be the ability to charge electric cars here and acknowledges that the applicant is going to apply for a variance, or maybe doesn't need to get into that, but just has a flexible enough approach to this topic that it can um, deal with these different eventualities. And I think if we all put our heads together, we can come up with that. So maybe Rob Wachilla could um, schedule a meeting for next week to deal with this. Mr. Meadows. Could I simply suggest that perhaps you might want to have representatives from the utility company to come in and see if they can assist you at the same time? Since they've, they're they the ones who are giving the grants and the wiring and everything else, maybe they've got a method to deal with this that might be a little more satisfactory. Maybe not, but at least you give it a shot. It makes sense. 
Okay. All right. So we know we've got um, a confusing situation. You guys are going to try to sit down. And I like the idea, perhaps with the vendors as well, they might be able to help and come back with some language for us for our next meeting. That gives some flexibility or a, a continence is you to go out and uh, try to get a variance or, or some kind of administrative relief. Mr. Wachilla. Um, so I do remember Mr. Mora, the billing commissioner, talked about um, this specific provision a while ago, and um, I think he had some ideas for uh, wording that we could do for this condition, but he also suggested possibly leaving the condition like this out because supposedly there's a provision, I don't know if it's under Chapter 40B or if it's under the state regs for um, Department of Housing and Livable Communities for uh, 40B projects that allows the billing commissioner to approve minor changes administratively. So I think we're gonna have to dig a little bit deeper into that, Mr. Chair, and um, see if we can meet and then draft something or or see what we can do to, to make this flexible for them if they wanted to, if they had to change the site layout because of the EV charging situation. Yeah, I think I'm gonna request that you guys put your heads together and come back with the best ideas you can in a month and hopefully or whenever well, the next time we meet on this uh, topic and give us the benefit of your most creative thinking. Uh, that's the best we can do at this point. All right. Are there other, so we've talked about local preference. We've talked about um, the lottery. We've talked about this kind of thorny EV problem. Um, are there any other major issues regarding the conditions that we that are contained in the, the uh, decision document that people want to go through before we go to start talking about the conditions and tentatively approving or amending conditions. All right. So if we're going to go into the con go into conditions, that would be part of a public meeting. And I want to first provide the opportunity for um, any public comment. Uh, on tonight's topic to the public, and then we'll move into the public meeting portion while keeping the public hearing portions of meeting still open, uh, and we can do some business in the uh, public meeting section. But first, this is when there'd be an opportunity for public comment before we move into the public meeting se session. Um, and so, Rob, will you take a look and see if there's anybody that wishes to comment from the public? And if so, uh, please, if you do, please make your comments to the board. Uh, keep your comments to about three minutes. And when you're recognized, please state your name and address for the record. So we do have one, Ms. Chair, uh, Grover Wayman Brown, Housing Narrative Lab. It's a, it's a big name, but I will give them speaking permissions. Okay. Uh, uh, hi, give you your name and address for the record, please. Sure. My name is Grover Wayman Brown, and I'm at 677 Station Road. And apologies um, for my work handle being on. I'm not actually speaking on behalf of them tonight. Um, I'm I'm calling as a member of the community and also as a member of the Affordable Housing Trust here in Amherst, just to strongly, strongly share my enthusiasm for this project and really it hearing where you're at in the process of considering each of the items today. I'm just really hopeful that um, the town and the board of the ZBA will work with Valley to, you know, keep the cost of each of these homes um, as affordable as possible so that they can continue their mission to create even more affordable homes. And so that, you know, the tenant, the, homeowners can live in, in really excellent quality homes, but also have them at a, an affordable price point. I've been working in the field of affordable housing advocacy, but also homelessness for more than 15 years. And it's really, uh, really despairing to see the need rise every year. And I'm really hopeful at how this project really is going to make a positive impact in our community, allowing so many families to um, have home ownership and also address many of the economic and, and racial equity goals that we have as a town in terms of increasing home ownership um, among communities of color and low-income communities. So thank you so much, and I appreciate you considering the project. Thank, thank you for your comment. 
Any other public comments? I see several members of the applicant's design and uh, organization, so no hands raised, uh, nobody else from the public in attendance. All right. If there's no other request for public comment, I would entertain a motion that we open a public meeting on this matter while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to gather for more information and uh, and when we continue this hearing uh, for the next uh, next meeting, um, so I'd entertain a motion to move to public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. Do I have such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? I think Mr. Meadows seconded it. Um, Did you want to take a break by now? I will, but we, we're going to vote okay. on this first, and then we'll take a break. Yep. Um, the mo is there any discussion on the motion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows, you're, you're muted. Sorry, aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. And Ms. Greenbaum. Aye. The vote is 5-0. We'll open the public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. It is uh, 7.40. Let's take a five-minute break, and we'll start to process through um, our first cut at the conditions. Thank you. See you all at, at uh, 7.45. Thank you.
All right. Um, I think we should reconvene at 746. Thanks, everybody, for coming back on time. I appreciate it. Um, what I'd like to do is um, start the process of going through conditions. And as we discussed earlier, um, what I'd like to do is tentatively approve, amend, or reject, give us our, our thoughts on the conditions as they are contained in the discussion document. And then we will come back for formal approval of the, or formal decision making on conditions, the next meeting that we've gone through, that we've uh, um, made a tentative decision on so far. In an earlier life, before there was track changes on, on Microsoft Word, this was called, in my life, this was called a Ramsire. And you struck things out you cut and you literally cut and paste. And <laughs> that's what, and I think Ramsire was the House Legislative Council for decades and came up with a system for doing this. So it's something that I'm familiar with in terms of um, uh, track changes in a, literally in paper and uh, scotch tape. Um, this is a lot easier. So what I'd like, and so that's what we'll do. We'll try to go through this um, and then make a decision on each of these, a tentative decision on each of these conditions. We'll come back and formalize that decision uh, one way or the other when we come back the next time uh, to deal with conditions. Everybody in um, copacetic with that proposal and the process? If not, forever uh, raise your hand or forever hold your peace, because here we go. All right, the first condition, I'm gonna, we're gonna do these by blocks. So the first is regulatory conditions and then move on to, to number to B, which is, I think, um, uh, utility management conditions. So we're gonna focus first on A, regulatory conditions. The first condition is the project shall be constructed in strict conformance. That's, I, that has to be um, one of it, that's standard, and has to be a, has to be a condition. To the extent that anybody disagrees with this, raise your hand, we'll deal with it one at a time. The project is initially subject to regulatory agreements. This just really goes through, uh, I've read through this, this just goes through exactly what is the, the program that they have to deal with. The key parts are that there's a regulatory agreement between Mass Housing and the applicant, and that there's 12, 10 dwelling units made available to households below 80%, and there are 20 units available to households earning at or below 100% of area median income. And the, that it's governed by the Commonwealth Builders Program and by mass housing and is subject to regulatory agreements between the applicant, the program, and AHR, or the um, um, AHR, I forget what AHR is, uh, documents applicable to each unit. Mr. Chair, AHR is the affordable housing restriction. We just uh, uh, condensed it, so it's a little bit easier than repeating that over and over. That's great, I'm, I'm all for that, less paper. 
Ms. Brestrup, I see your hands up. Yes, so um, we've been having discussions here in the office, and I think we've shared this idea with um, the two attorneys here that we feel that the town should be um, a party to the regulatory agreement. And I think there was some talk about doing some research with Commonwealth Builders or someone to find out if that was appropriate, but we we would like to bring up that topic and um, make mm -hmm. sure that it gets resolved. Great. Um, I see that that's, Ms. Brestrup, I see that that's a comment on number three, the next, uh, the next uh, condition. So we'll, I know it's raised here in uh, number two, but on, I see that it's on three. Is this uh, my, my note? Is it is this concluded or not? So what this what this has is it describes this condition um, two describes the thirty the, that eighty percent is that thirty year restriction, a hundred percent is at a fifteen year restriction with a second um, shared equity restriction as well. With it, so it describes the two different programs depending upon the. Um, the, the income level of the successful purchaser. Does anybody have any questions about that? Okay. And as I read through the um, struck out, stricken out language, and I read through the um, language that's proposed to be inserted in lieu thereof, it looks to me like it accurately describes the programs, um, this, the, describes the program as we've understood it and, and has been presented by the applicant. Number three is a question that Ms. Brestrup raises. And um, I, it seems to me the town should be a part of the, a party to the regulatory agreement. What, what is the issue there that's, um, for our consideration and why is there is there an issue about this from the either the applicant or from the state it's just that the language needs to get hashed out with mass housing commonwealth builders um folks there i think believe they're amenable to it and i forwarded an email as such to the town um they'll just need to coordinate on language okay so we don't have language yet before us uh, in concept this is something that we everybody agrees to uh does any, anybody disagree with it in concept if not we'll deal with the language uh the next time we meet does this give the if, if the town is a party to the agreement does this give the town ownership rights no the agreement the and you have a draft agreement it was given to you in one of the previous meetings along with the deed writer so you have it and you can go back and and look at the details of it but um, really what it is, is it's an agreement between the funders and the developer to make sure that we're doing affirmative fair housing marketing plan, that we're hiring the right monitoring agent. Um, so it kind of lays out the process of how we are um, going about our process. Okay. And what's the value of having a town party of that? The or town is one of the funders. So because they have CPA money and housing trust money into the um and have committed that, they would be one of the funders. No, I understand. If there's one of the funders, they should be part of the agreement. I got it. Number four, the applicant shall notify the board and the town manager when building permits are issued um, and cooperate with in the preparation of requested forms um, with the blah 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 blah. The applicant shall notify the board and town manager when I can see permits. This is just keeping the town informed uh, on a regular basis and it seems to it's not objectionable to me. It's good. It's just good business sense to keep the town informed and require um, communications between the developer and the town. Number five, the regulatory agreement is in effect. The affordability monitoring agent has identified the regulatory agreement. So be responsible to monitor compliance. Um, with the town and request and the town may request and shall be provided by the applicant with all information that is provided to the affordability monitoring agent with the exception of personally identifying information um and that just keeps the town informed as much as as well as the uh the uh, um affordability monitoring agent number six again if anybody has questions raise them as we go through these 
No provision here under shall be deemed to limit the town's authority to enforce the provision of this comprehensive permit in accordance with legal exercise of its enforcement powers. If the town becomes responsible for monitoring the affordability requirements of the project, the applicant shall provide the town with a reasonable monitoring fee, the same to be determined at the appropriate the same to be determined at the appropriate time based on monitoring fees paid for similar services. All right, this is the number seven is local preference. And what this does is this provides for a local preference, as we discussed earlier, of 70% of the dwelling units. So that's, you know, here it says seven homes is struck out. And that's where I got the seven homes, Ms. Allen or Carolyn. Can you, I knew there's a place where I got seven when I was looking at it. So, it was, but, so we have seven here, but it's struck out, 21 is struck out. Please explain to me what's what's going on, and then we can talk about the uh, whether we want to impose a local preference or not. Certainly, and um, my understanding is that the seventy percent local preference can apply to the eighty percent AMI units. So we have ten AMI units; seventy percent become seven. Um, so, and I think that uh, originally. Uh, 21, I think originally we were thinking that 70% of all 30 units could be subject to the local preference. Well, we just, we just had this discussion and, and Ms. Allen, you, I think you mentioned that the 70% applied, I, I thought it applied to seven. You said it applied to all 30. Um, how do we, that this is an important difference. How do we make it? How do we know which, how many units are, is the local, is local preference applicable to? Is it just the 80% or is it, is it all, is it 80 and 100% units? My understanding when we had the Commonwealth Builder program up here, yeah. she indicated 21 units would be applicable for local preference if it's the um if it's the will of the board i can reach out to her via email and get something written that verifies what that number is who is the determining agent or the determining it's uh, mass housing because they're the they're the they're the subsidizing agency that provided the project eligibility letter that allowed us to move forward in 40b Right. And they're also the funder. So, for, so Mass Housing is the authority on this. They are the um, they are our forty B permit grantor um, at the state level, and then they are also our funder. Okay. Well, um, we need to have that decision uh, clarified for us, as you know, before I think we make a final decision on local preference. The extent to which it applies to the project is an important factor. Um, Mr. White, you had your hand up. Um, yeah, you addressed it, uh, Mr. Chair. Like I said, that's why I was just going to ask that we definitely have further clarification on what that concrete number is going to be. But thank you. So um, what I'd like to do with this is talk generally, about, give people the opportunity to talk generally about the notion of local preference, whether it's 70 or 21. I don't want, I'm not ready to, I, I'm not ready to suggest we take a vote, even a tentative vote on this, until we know where it applies, but I'd like to get a feeling for the board from the board about how they feel about the concept of local preference as it was outlined in that, um, I think, very helpful um, chart that Ms. Allen presented. And I'd also like to ask Ms. Allen and Ms. Murray um, to jointly try to um, get an answer to this from Mass Housing uh, for our next meeting. And if you both work on that, that I, I'd be very appreciative. So let's open up the con the, the discussion about local preference. I'll begin. Um, I am in support of local preference for a couple of reasons. I think it gives, um, it helps to, to provide public support for these kinds of activities to the extent that um, there is some level of support given to people in our own community, whether they work, whether they uh, go to, have the children that go to school here, where they live here. And it is not the most important, it is not the most important factor. It's the third factor out of three factors. And that the other two are the ones that, the, the other two factors are really the determinative 
determinative factors on whether this uh, housing should be made available to them if they meet all the qualifications. That is the, uh, the household size and the, um, the, the QCT or the uh, disproportionately affected um, populations. I think that needs, I think that still needs to be the most important criteria for selection. But I think it is also important to the extent that we're involved in this financially and we're involved in providing support that to the extent we can, giving a little, a little bit of um, benefit to our local residents and to people that live, work, and send their children to school here would help with the public support for this. And I also think it's, uh, it's responsible use of our city's, our town's investment in time and money in this project. That's generally where I think. Um, I'd like to hear from other people. Ms. Greenbaum. Yes, um, I will respond to that issue first, and then I have two questions. Um, I am definitely in favor of, of uh, local preference because we keep building more and more affordable housing here, and our people are still looking for places to live, people who live, work, and so the, the, the whole category. Our neighbors are not keeping up to their percentages, and we're filling the needs of the towns around us, and I don't think that's particularly fair. Um, my other question is, when you get back to these um, eligibility requirements, you have an elderly couple with a caretaker. Would that count as a household? Or if somebody's disabled and, and they have um, nurses that live in, would that, would that qualify for a two-bedroom household? And then in the case of if they decide that the three people in a two bedroom unit um, can constitute a household, even though there's no the legal connection between them. Um, how, would, how, could, how would the income, um, what do you call it? income qualification work if, if you have three unrelated people, like three widows or a couple with a, with a um, a nurse that lives in something like that. That was more of a question. I think that's, that's a good a lot of affordability. You got to establish what the household is, and then, Ms. Allen, would you just combine the household incomes? Without the, the, you would combine all the incomes of the members of whatever is determined to be the household. Yeah, I think there's usually set as a, as a head of household, and then um, other other members of that household. I mean. You're not going to have incomes uh, coming in for an eight-year-old, so it's really, um, you know, it's the head of household and then other members, is my understanding. But this is why we have a, a, a monitoring agent. This is why we hire a third party to hold these lottery processes for us. Um, they make sure that it, it abides by the rules. But if it's like three widows, when you go ask a question about the household, find out how they would figure the income. That's just to add to your list. Income eligibility is the word I'm thinking. Other comments on local preference or on the wording of the this condition other than the applicability to seven or 21 units? So I, I, I am not in favor of the local preference. I am concerned that under the local preference, we're going to marginalized already marginalized people and i think the, the goal here is to um start creating equity for a certain class of people that cannot otherwise afford housing um and i also i'm, I'm not sure that um the seven i, I do believe if I'm reading everything correctly and understand everything correctly, I do believe the number is going to be more seven than it's 21 for local preference, because again, I think we're going to, it's going to be the 70% of the 80% AMI. And so I'm not sure if it warrants saying we should, you know, make local preference um, for seven houses. And then at the same time, um, it's 
I, I just have those kind of concerns as to if we go, if, if the number is actually 21 and we have a local preference, I, I fear that um, it's not going to be very equitable in terms of who qualifies for these houses. Other comments on this, on local preference? Uh, I am in. I am in favor of the local preference. I think it's. I know know of people in town who could qualify on many bases and cannot find housing that uh, is satisfactory, and it will it will greatly enhance the uh, the people in this town who who can't. Can't find housing otherwise. Mr. White. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could, uh, because as it stands, I am in favor of the local preference, but if I could ask Mr. Henry to kind of expand upon his concerns um, to maybe give a bit more definition into how that, that would be more un inequitable, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is a discussion. This, this is exactly what we're, we should be having as a discussion on, on these issues. So if, if I understood correctly, when when this initially started, there was um, an, an intent um, that developments community would benefit um, BIPOC and other marginalized communities uh, who cannot otherwise afford it housing through quote unquote open market. Um, and so the reality is that we live in a town that um, the BIPOC community is very small. So if we just, if we go um, local preference and just being devil's advocate and from day one, I've been saying that um, BIPOC communities are disadvantaged with um, credit ex being extended to them. And if they cannot come up with um, a bank to, to say, okay, you have a job, um, you're working, you've been working at this job for two or three years, however, your credit isn't what we would consider um, help, you know, I mean, Again, be mindful that people have to be given um, extended credits by a bank um, at whatever market interest, whatever interest rate the bank thinks they qualify for. So understanding that there's that disparity historically, and it's, it is going to be there because, again, I do not believe that the average person is sitting out there with 50000 or $60,000 to to make a down payment on a property. And so if that requirement is there and they cannot meet that requirement, they fall off the list and it moves down. And I think, you know, with a local preference, I'm very much concerned that that's just gonna happen. It's while the goal was well intended, I do not believe um, that it is going to have the desired effect of helping marginalize BIPOC community because I am genuinely concerned that they're not going to be able to get the credit qualifications that's been asked of them to get into one of these properties. Yeah, Mr. Chair, can I ask a question of Mr. Henry? Just because I want to make sure that absolutely, I this is you certainly can, Mr. Boyd. It's your show. I just want to make sure. <laughs> no, that's fine. I'm encouraging discussion here. Uh, uh, Mr. Henry, it, please correct me if I'm hearing this wrong or interpreting wrong, but it almost seems to me like you're discussing two separate issues. Um, because, of course, I agree with everything you're saying. Uh, um, however, an inability to qualify for the program would bar anyone from taking part in this housing community. Um, how does local preference disadvantage BIPOC individuals specifically in the situation? So one of the one of the questions that um, 
Miss, um, Miss, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgive me if I forget your name, Miss Bishop has been asking is about, um, you know, if two people live together, pull their, pull their resources together, would they qualify, um, you know, what, what constitutes a household member? And, you know, so I, I think there is that aspect of it where um, there may be some people who can do that and pull those resources together and be qualified. And so, you know, I, I do not believe that is going to be the same for BIPOC community, because again, it all comes down to what resources they have available to them. And I do not, and where non-BIPOC people may have family members or people who want to help them to say, oh, there's a house, but I don't have this, I can help you. And through no fault of their own. And, and again, be mindful. I'm not saying, you know, if someone has the ability to help, you know, someone who needs affordable housing, yes, that is great. And they should do that. But um, it's on its face. I think it's just going to be where um, the BIPOC community is going to be, again, marginalized because they're not going to be able to do the things that non-BIPOC people will be able to do to get into these houses. So it's, um, I, and, and, and again, it may, it may also not have to do with, um, you know, intent to discriminate. It's just, that is the reality. It's, um, but it seems to me, sorry, yeah. Mr. Henry, it seems to me That's that okay. your issue is more surrounding the financial requirements as opposed to the local preference. Are you just suggesting that we cast a wider net? But, but even with the local preference, I think on its face, the local preference is discriminatory because essentially we are saying that, you know, we're locking this down to only people that live in this town. So if, yeah. um, if, yeah. Someone else, and and don't quote me on this town because I saw the geography. Um, but we're also saying that you know, if someone who lives in a neighboring town who, again, has never had this opportunity in their town, but they've been saving, they've been working hard, and decides, oh, here's an opportunity to Amherst. Um, if they don't meet that local preference, or if that local preference is so stringent, they may not be able to do it because again, we have that local preference that says the people have to be either in our schools, work in our town, or whatever the criteria is for local preference. But so Mr. Henry, I, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm working hard here to try to, to come to your position, but it comes down to, in my view, it comes down to that person who just, if they don't have the money, if they don't have the financial situation to qualify, whether they're, whether there is local preference or not, they're not going to be able to avail themselves of, of the program. The program would have to be designed some way else. And we can't do that. We have to take the program as it's given to us by the state and by the, of, of the, uh, the state agency. Um, and that is fair, and I agree with you. Yeah. But in, in my latter example, what if, you know, we have a BIPOC family that is not, doesn't qualify for local preference because, um, but if there was no local preference, they would be able to qualify for one of these houses because they've worked hard, they've saved, they've been looking, but maybe in their town, this opportunity is not there, there's no affordable housing but then they have the financial resources that they've been saving for years and years. But now here Amherst has this program, but there is this local preference provision. Therefore they cannot, they won't qualify even if they have the financial resources. Well, they would, if they, they could qualify for, first off, there's 30% of the program that for which the local preference doesn't apply, no matter if it's seven or 21 units, right? So there's either three or, or nine, however many of the units we finally decide is here is applicable. Um, but they would, local preference wouldn't make a difference. So that there would be some available, not none. That's the first thing. And that's not a total answer to your question, but it's just a clarification that it's, a, it's applicable to the local preference 
portion, not the entire program. I get that. Um, and the second part is it, it, it looks to me like that if that person from another community um, meets the first and the second tiers, either they are, they meet the family size, which is the most important criteria, or they meet the a QCT, which they couldn't if they're from another city, but they might meet the, um, the um, disproportionately impacted test. That gives them, you know, a, a whole lot of, that gives them the predominant likelihood that they will be approved for the program. The most important, those are the two most important criteria, and it's only, it's kind of at the, it's the differential for some, but not, not many, and, and the examples I know aren't real world, but it, it didn't affect a large number of the, of the awards in the example we were given today. So I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm thinking that it's really, it's, it's re for so many people, it's really the, it's the fact of the matter, it's been a historical, it's been through historical discrimination that these, they have not had, or systemic discrimination, that they have not had the ability to gain the kind of um, wealth and assets that allow them, allow for um, having a financial situation in which a bank is going to give them a loan. That's, and I don't know how we, we try to, we try to adjust that by giving preference for housing and the first and the second preference was the first two tiers, but we haven't. And so there's, there's some benefit there for that, but it's still, it still doesn't matter if you, it, no matter who you are, if you don't have the financial qualifications, you're not going to be able to, that person is not going to be able to qualify for the, 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 the program. And, and, I, and, and I do not disagree with you. It, yeah, it, is, yeah. it is an issue that cannot be solved with us voting right. yes or no for this project. But to, to some of the points that you just made, there's a historical um, there is. Impact, impact to minorities. And I, I just think that um, local preference has discriminatory effect. It's, you know, it, it may not be intended to be that way, but looking at the history of when um, minorities couldn't live in certain neighborhoods or um, I just think that it increases, local preference has a tendency to increase, reinforce, and quite frankly, continue to perpetuate segregated housing patterns. And I, and given that we live in a town that the majority is non-BIPOC, I think a local preference will continue to do just that. Yeah, I understand, I understand your point. Um, We've got a couple other people that have their hands raised. I'd like to first go to another board member and then Ms. Allen's had her hand up and Ms. Brustrup has also had her hand up. So I would have one other, before we go, I would have just one question. Can we have a, I, I fail to remember the definition of disproportionately impacted household. And I would hope that somebody could give me, can, can we define what that is? Um, Sure. It's, uh, it was in one of the previous memos yeah. that was provided. So it's really three categories. Um, one is those that live in qualified census tracts. Right. The second is, uh, I think it's 100, 140% of poverty, which those individuals are not going to be qualifying for a home. Um, and third is those that qualify for certain federal benefits. So free and reduced lunch, um, WIC, those sorts of things. Again, a lot of those individuals probably wouldn't have the financial capacity to apply for a home, which is why Commonwealth Builders has indicated that what they're seeing is the biggest qualifier is the geographic location of, of a household. And that is that is placing them in the disproportionately impacted household. Um, so what you're saying is that the, QC, the QCT is the biggest factor. Correct. That puts them Correct. In the yep, living in a QCT. Um, so, um, I can also respond to Mr. Henry's comments regarding, uh, the financial literacy. We have a very robust marketing plan that tends to address that. So I'm happy to address that now, or I can wait until Ms. Greenbaum's had her comment. Why don't we, 
that would be valuable to hear, but let's have the board members and then Ms. Brush speak and then we can, you can provide some background, Ms. Allen. Ms. Ms. Greenbaum. Oh. You're muted. Sorry. My 60 year experience living here is that he's incorrect. We have a lot of minority, more than half the school population is minority which doesn't necessarily mean that they qualify in terms of income to afford these houses, but the school system is is more than half minority or very close to it. And, and we have a lot of, you know, um, people that work at the university that are minorities that look at. I understand that the word has gotten out already that people should begin to put money away for a down payment and they are um, particularly minorities who have been complaining, three of them, at least three that I can think of applied, um, ran for a town council who are renters paying more in rent now than the uh, mortgages and utilities will cost on these houses. So I, a list is, is going around of, of people who will be applying for these houses from everything I hear. And, and as they say, they are middle income people who, who uh, live and work here, some born here. Um, I think there is a local market and I think that they should have priority over somebody from Sunderland which refuses to um, have their 10% since he picks on Rulin as an example, I absolutely, you know, my vote for this whole project depends on whether our local people have a chance to live there. So that's just what I want to say. Okay, thank you. Ms. Prestrup? I think my first point has to do with um, something that Jessica is going to talk about. And I'll just briefly mention it, that Valley CDC has a training program for people who are intending to become homeowners and people can take advantage of that, you know, a few years in advance of the homes actually being available. So I'm sure that Jessica will speak to that more. But the other point I wanted to make is Amherst has over 10% affordable housing. And we try very hard to keep having projects in the pipeline that provide more affordable housing. But it is a matter of Amherst voting to contribute to these projects and the housing trust, the affordable housing trust contributes and other um, aspects of town government contribute. So um, in order to keep people be being willing to keep contributing to affordable housing projects, I think it's important that they have a sense that some people who live in Amherst might benefit if they feel that only people who live elsewhere will benefit, they may be more reluctant to contribute. So that's what I had to say. Thank you. Ms. Allen, um, Ms. Greenbaum, are you, is your hand up for a new comment? Is that no, I'm sorry, I forgot to hang right. up. Ms. Allen, uh, you were gonna talk a little bit about the financial literacy education. Yeah, so, um, so, to Mr. Henry's point, this is something that we've been thinking a lot about and about how do we move forward to make sure that we're marketing to BIPOC households and that we're getting them in a financial place so that they're able to purchase. Um, so we have had some initial conversations and we're awaiting a proposal from, um, from two um, businesses that are in the eastern part of the state but have assisted other Commonwealth builder developers in the lottery and financial literacy process. Um, the one firm is DVM Housing Consultants, um, and the other is Our Village Initiative. And the housing consultants, they would assist with the marketing and lottery piece of, of the project. Um, in Our Village Initiative, they are financial literacy. They are both um, owned by Black women. They focus on this um, and, and understand the importance of financial literacy. And so we've had an initial conversation with them. We have nothing sort of set plans, but um, you know, the earlier we are able to hold a lottery process and get people in place gives um, 
prospective homeowners more time to get their financial ducks in a row. So we're trying to look at what makes the most sense in terms of a timeline. Um, can we do a lottery, you know, when we start construction, knowing that we have a year and a half, two years almost before people are able to move in, um, getting people within that um, with our village initiative. Um, Denisha just like stays on them. You know, have you paid down this? Have you paid down that? How much are you saving up? Um, so, you know, I think we've got a really solid partnership and and folding that in with what Valley does. So we're trying to figure out how does this make the most sense to work with these two organizations that have already done this with other Commonwealth Builder projects, get people financially ready, get them into the process, get them excited. Um, and so, you know, we'll be working with them. We're already pulling together lists of Black organizations, Black-owned businesses in Amherst and throughout the Pioneer Valley region. Where can we do some marketing? Where can we do some um, workshops if needed? So we do have a very robust plan. We don't plan to just go in and build and hope for the best. Like we have a very intentional process here for the marketing piece to make sure that we're targeting households that we want to make sure are ready and able to go when the lottery is is um, is happening. So I just wanted to brief the board on that. It's nothing set in stone yet. Like I said, it's a proposal, but we've had a great conversation and I think it's gonna be a very valuable partnership as part of this project. Um, Ms. Allen, is there a way that we can, that you can work with us into trying to uh, come up with language that requires outreach to um, the BIPOC community uh, in Amherst and uh, in the area um, to number one, uh, advertise th that these are gonna be available and then work with, app work with qualified applicants to, to um, and help them to provide, uh, to apply for the program. So as the town is, is a member of the regulatory agreement, this is what the regulatory agreement spells out, is the affirmative fair housing marketing plan, how that process works, working with our monitoring agent. So I think signing on to that, um, it, you're already sort of part of the process. I don't think we need to add more language to the decision unless you absolutely want to, but you know, understand that that is our intent and we are already yeah. have processes in place to move forward, so. I'm, I'm trying to find a way to um, provide some definition or some cert some certainty for people who are concerned that we wouldn't um, be having enough outreach to some of the traditionally underserved communities. And I'd like to try to, and maybe I have to go back and read the regulatory agreement that might be helpful and might answer my question. What I'm looking for is something that's that says we're going to we want to get out there. We want to get out there early. We want to give people a year and a half or however long, as early as possible to get their ducks in order so that they can qualify. And we want to help them do it as much as possible, not only through notification, but through uh, what it sounds like your um, your program has. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way to, um, I'll have to read the regulatory agreement first, but I'm wondering sure. if there's a way to describe I mean, that. If, in if you, if you felt like you needed to put a condition in there that said something like the applicant will make all best effort to um, to market to BIPOC businesses, organizations in the town of Amherst. I mean, we're and then using amenable to that. Examples of, and then say, which would include A, B, C, and D, some things that, things that you've talked about doing. Yep. Sure. I mean, not, like I said, nothing is set in stone. We're still waiting on proposals and we're still sure. trying to figure out what the program is going to be and how it's going to work and how Valley will partner with these individuals. Um, but I think you can put some soft language in there that, you know, so, and I think to the best effort or to the, you know, something to that effect. Um, Mr. Henry, I know that's not um, completely an answer to the questions you've raised, but I think the, the problem is that there are going to be some people that, no matter how much outreach we do, they they don't have the financial, they don't have the financial wherewithal to to apply. But we know there's enough people that would have financial um, assets and the financial standing to apply, especially if they're given and successfully apply and qualify for the program. If they're given a lot, if we reach out to them, inform them about it, and also then provide assistance so they can get to that 
they can make put their finances in the best possible light for a bank to approve a loan. And that outreach would at least help increase the number of, of, of folks and, and particularly local folks that might be able to qualify for this program. And it doesn't deal with the fundamentally hard problems that we've got a lot of people that don't, that, that aren't going to qualify financially. Would that be something that you and I could work on that would um, draw your support for a, a local preference? And the benefit of that is that we can, I think we increase the public support for, for the, these kinds of programs in the future. So I, I am in favor and to, I, I would make two comments. So yep. I am in favor of doing anything that helps um, support our local BIPOC community. And while I would agree that our middle school has uh, minorities, um, for those that have university parents, they make way too much money, so they don't count. Um, if they work, if they're a teacher, if they're a professor at the university, then I'm sure they're over the poverty guidelines. Um, and for the remaining others that um, would would qualify into this, it's um, I while I appreciate the outreach and I think it's great that Valley is doing all these things. Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's it, it doesn't change the reality um, that you know if a and, and let's use this as an example mm -hmm. if if there's if there's a single mom of two making um, say fifty five thousand dollars a year and she has and I imagine that dollar value um, but if she has credit card debt and student loans and you know medical bills that she's paying to get by and then she has to deal with her everyday bills like overpriced rent utilities it is going to be very very hard for this person to save any money at all within a year or two to even have arguably a two or three percent down payment for these properties that is just the reality because um you cannot adjust her income to meet this because again, whatever job he, she has, you know, if her income does not increase, you know, whatever counseling she gets, um, whatever sacrifices she's willing to make to say, I'm going to cut these bills. I, I, I just fear it is not going to be sufficient enough to actually even make any kind of significant dent that puts her on the radar. But again, um, just going back to my overarching theme here is that when a community has a smaller proportion of minority residents than the larger geographic area where it draws applicants from, the process is going to favor its residents. It, there's going to be disparity if that if a local preference is chosen. If if the it's based on peer numbers. If there's going to be disparity if there's a local preference. Will there be disparity in the, if the local preference is? On, on, there's going to be disparity on minorities. If if the if the if the community has a smaller proportion of minority residents, um, and there is a local preference. And again, tied with the finances, there, I, I fail to see where it will not adversely impact minorities. But we all agree that the local preference isn't just residents of, of Amherst, but it's if you work here or if you um, go to school here or if you, uh, your children go to school here, um, it's beyond just, you do agree that it's just beyond, beyond just people who reside in Amherst, but it's it's broader than just the Amherst geographical limits because you have people from other towns that come in and can meet local preference even though they don't reside in Amherst. And, and, and maybe that's part of what um, needs to be further sparsed out is, are we just talking about surrounding towns of Amherst? How far away are we talking where this local preference would be applicable? 
Well, um, I, it's, that's a good point. I mean, I think about it and, you know, I don't know if people come, how far they come to work at UMass or how far they come to work in some of the, I don't know what that commute is, um, yeah. but I would gather that we would have people from, you know, quite a long ways come into town that would either work here. And I don't know how many people have their children going to school here that don't live in Amherst. I suppose there's some, but I don't know how many um, there are. But I think there's there would be there would be some people that live outside the jurisdiction of the town who still have the who have the um, uh, the connection through their job or through other other means to fit the local preference. Um, while, I, while I appreciate the conversation and everything that um, Valley CDC is doing, I, I am still not convinced that this will not disproportionately impact um, the BIPOC community. So um, I, I will do all mm -hmm. that I can to help with awareness and marketing and whatever it can be done, but I'm still not going to support the local preference. I understand. Mr. White. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So yeah, my kind of question would be with this, because I want to make sure obviously that I'm learning everything that I can, how far we are talking about, um, like looking at an area outside, because while we've been talking, I just pulled up some quick numbers from the most recent census. Um, the national, this is for the United States, the most recent census, uh, the percentage of the U.S. population, which uh, would qualify as BIPOC is 43.6%. Amherst, same census, everything uh, is coming in at 36.8%. And once again, that's by, total BIPOC population which does give us a difference from the national to the local of 6.8 percentage points. However, I also pulled up Hadley um, and Hadley is showing a total percentage yeah. of BIPOC as only 8.4%, 91.6% of the census registered as Caucasian. So that would be my question. What other areas around Amherst and how far are we drawing that arrow out? to say that this will be disproportionately affecting the BIPOC community? Well, I think you need to remember that the second priority is the qualified census tract. So right. Hadley is not a qualified census tract. You know, you have to go and look at the qualified census tract map in order to understand who could qualify for local preference, who could qualify for appropriately sized household and the DIH and local preference. They would have to be commuting from where? Greenfield. Yeah. Um, Holyoke, Springfield, Chicopee. So if you have local, if your local preference and you're an appropriately sized household, you're still not going to meet, you're not going to float to the top because floating to the top is those top two priorities, that green and that blue, right? And that chart, the yellow is, is at the, uh, is, is third in line. So you can, and I think I tried to make a mix to show that you could, Where's the chart now? I have to find it again in my file. But but that that really living in the qualified census tract makes a difference. So you could be local preference and you could work in Amherst and you can live in Hadley and that doesn't help you. You could work, you could live in East Hampton. That doesn't help you. So you have to be living in a qualified census tract as what Commonwealth Builders is seeing to qualify under that DIH. So and you no, have to think about it in the regional sense of that way of where the qualified census tracks are. That's going to bubble people up to the top of the of the tier. So, so even if so, with, with that rationale, even if we voted for a local preference, um, we could get to your point. Qualified applicants from all these cities in the census tract. If they have a qualified census tract, yes, they would be. They would, if they live in a qualified census tract, they would meet the second criteria. <clears throat> and as I've noted, Amherst has two qualified census tracts. The only other one in the entire Hampshire County is in Ware. So all of Hampshire County communities would not meet that DIH, most likely. 
Unless, but, unless potentially they're a Section 8 voucher holder that maybe has saved enough money living in a Section 8 housing that they're able to buy a house. So that is one other indicator that the Commonwealth Builders has been seeing, but mostly it's geographically located. So it would be, so the qualified census tract would be Amherst and then everybody else, so to speak. Well, no, no, no. I, I think the qualified census tract would be, in this case, in, in Hampshire County, would be Amherst and where? And not the whole town of Amherst, only two areas of Amherst. To be and, sure. and then where is, it's got a qual And then I would guess that there's a parts of Greenfield, um, and Chicopee. Greenfield, Chicopee, Holyoke, Springfield. Hmm. Um, if you go out to... Um, I'd have to look at Berkshire County, but probably pit some sections of Pittsfield. South Deerfield, um, maybe. Would that be one? Well, I don't yeah. know. Anyway, but those are the no, huh? Okay. So but, I mean, I, if you want, I can pull up a I can pull up the qualified census track of the region if you'd like, and you can see where those communities are. But the point being is that yeah. Amherst has two <laughs> more than anybody else in this in this county already. Yeah. And so you're already ahead of the game without putting the, local preference on as a priority. Where are the two neighborhoods in Amherst? It's North Amherst. And I think we reviewed this. I can pull, if you want to stop uh, screen sharing, I can pull up this information pretty quickly. Please go ahead. Yep. Uh, I believe one of them is in the Cushman area. Am I correct on that? Um, North Amherst? Kellogg Street. Kellogg Street. That sounds Kellogg about right. Kellogg Street area and, and north of there. Yeah. It may be because of all of the affordable units that are already on Kellogg. So do you see this map here? I yeah, can try I to can. blow it up a little bit. Hold on. Just give me a sec. Um, well, that's like the entirety of North Amherst. Correct. And this oh, is, wow. again, to, re to recap and refresh, we're able to do this project because it's located in a qualified census tract. Under the initial mm -hmm. Commonwealth Building Builder financing guidelines, this is a qualifying site. Now it's not. They've changed the regulation. So qualified census tracts are no longer eligible geographically for Commonwealth Builder money. So this is census track, um, whoops, 8203. And it gives, this is census data. And to pull, and we've talked about this a little bit at the last, but for race and ethnicity within this census tract specifically, we have 66 white, 8% Black, 9% Asian, 11% that um, that identify as two or more, and 4% Hispanic within the census tract. So that's the that's the racial makeup within North Amherst. Now I can pull up the second one, which is 8205. And it's just south. It kind of like wraps around. Here's UMass. So it's downtown area and then down here and it ends at Mill Valley. So this is the second qualified census tract within Amherst. And again, if we go and we look at the racial makeup, this, this census tract is 79% white, 1% black, 6% Asian, 1% that identify as two or more and 12% Hispanic. So that gives you some census information about the two census tracts. In Amherst. I, I fear that this map just proves my point. But it also is, it, I understand, but that's the, the first, that's the second, quali second qualifier for um, selection. And that's not a discretionary thing on our part. That's the program definition. And I understand. Yeah. But the first one had, um, 60 some percent, which would be more reflective of the numbers that Mr. White pulled up for, um, I think BIPOC, BIPOC communities was about, people in Amherst was 36%. Is that what you're- 36.8 total. More reflective of that. Well, it seems to me that um, this has been a really good discussion. And I mean, this is a hard issue and everybody is trying to find the best response possible for the the town here. What I would, I think there's a couple of things we need to do. First thing is we need to figure out if it's seven or 21 units and we'll have that for the next meeting. That'd be really helpful. 
Um, the second thing is, uh, let's highlight the, the regulatory agreement. Rob, send it to me and, and to anybody else that's interested and see if there's some kind of language that we can come up with that, that um, um, elucidates a outreach and assistance program that um, we can agree upon uh, beyond I mean, beyond the, the representations made by Miss Allen, I should think of great, but I'd like to put something in there that we really commit to it in the, if we need to in the, in the conditions, come up with something there. And um, we're not ready to vote on this, but this is not decided yet because we need to know the scope of the program, but we should be ready to make a decision in uh, the next time we get together on this issue. So that's what my proposal is. That, and given that, I'd like to move on to some more Can conditions. Can I ask my question before you move on? Sure. Uh, my question was regard to Mr. Henry. What, what if we don't uh, accept local preference and it so happens that we get 25 people who qualify under the first two sections here? Can we get, can we put 25 people into the units if we have not accepted local preference, if they qualify under the tier one and tier two? I'm sorry, are you asking? Are you asking if they're not from Amherst? I'm asking if we have people who apply, who live in the qualified census tracts, and qualify by number of family members, but they happen to all live in Amherst and there's more than 21 of them and we have not accepted local preference. Can they get these units by virtue of being in tiers one and tiers two, even though they're more than the 70% that we would get on the local preference? And that's, the answer is yes. That's my word. I, I can respond to that. So, yeah. what would happen is once you fill your tier one, if you've filled 21, let's say it's 21, then anybody who didn't get selected under 21 would get folded into tier two and they would go through the lottery selection process with everybody else that is also qualifying in tier two. But that's not what I'm asking. I'm saying we have not accepted. I'm following this to Henry, uh, uh, his logic. So we have people that apply and they qualify as having the right number of kids and live in a qualified census tract in Amherst. And this is without asking for, for local preference. And they happen to be 25, 26 or all 30 that qualify under one and two, but they all live here. Can they all, even having not voted for local preference, can they all come from Amherst and fill the 30 units yes. if they qualify yes. for the yes. other? Yes, if you did yes. not, if you did not adopt local preference, if you did adopt local preference, yeah. then you'd hit your 21 and then anybody else who didn't get selected in the 21 would get bumped down to tier two and would have to compete with everybody in tier two. But they could be from Amherst. They, you could have Amherst residents who are competing, or Amherst qualified residents who are competing in tier two, correct? Correct. Yeah. So it really doesn't matter how we vote on this issue. I'm following up on, on his logic, I think. So it really doesn't matter, yes or no. Because but we might have more people living there if we don't accept it. But by that the logic, also, if we have a local preference, um, we may be excluding people from Amherst, isn't that correct? No. No. Because it doesn't the local, you, does the local did, preference yes. caps it, it caps it. Yes, if you did, if you had local preference in the tier one would have to meet all three of those criteria. The blue, the green, or the green, the blue, and the yellow. <laughs> um, well, but they'd have to meet the green and the blue without local preference. Correct. And then with local preference, they'd have to meet for 70 green and blue. And then for the remaining 30, they'd have to meet green and blue and not yellow. And so they could be, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be um, put at a disadvantage by being an Amherst resident in the second pool. 
They'd just be, right? They'd just be competing like everybody else. They'd be competing like everybody else as if you had no local preference and right. they're competing. And they're still, and the Amherst residents still has a shot at it, even in that case. I think in Amherst the, residents have a bigger shot anyway because they live in a qualified census tract or those that do live could. in a qualified yeah, census tract. Some do, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I do want to just comment. I went back in my email and I did ask the question to Mass Housing um, and said there was a comment at the last public hearing that the local preference would only be applicable to 80% AMI homes. Given all the homes would be counted on the subsidized housing inventory, is the statement true? Please clarify. And I just want to read her response. Um, I'm not sure what comment you're referring to or who made it, um, <laughs> whether or not and at what level to apply local preference is not our hunt. So it's not the Commonwealth Builders Program. Uh, it's really going to be a decision under the 40B program, and I'm going to have to look to the 40B folks to get clarification. But in terms of the Commonwealth Builders, it's pretty clear that that is not local preference is not really how they look to have the program designed. So I just wanted to put that for you to think about. That's all. But that just means that somebody else makes that decision, and we just have to figure out who makes a decision as to whether it applies to seven or 21, right? Yes, but I would. it's not the Commonwealth Builders Program. It could be the state. It could be the state. It's uh, the 40B right. program. Right, which is the state program. Correct. Okay. All right. So what I'd like, to, I think we've had a really good discussion about this. We still have some information we have to get. Um, and I'd like to move on to the rest of the conditions if we possibly can and just go through them as um, quickly as we can. It's about, uh, it's only got 10 minutes left. So number eight is exactly what we were talking about, Ms. Allen. Um, we might think about coming up with some language that provides more of an affirmative um, just declaration of things to do for outreach as well as support. Number nine, um, I don't think there's any, you gotta provide the subsidizing agency pursuant to the, the regs. Um, number 10, that this, the board acknowledges the restrictions and obligations imposed and shall expire in accordance with their terms set forth in each. This one is highlighted for some reason, and why is that? Can either Rob or Christine, can you tell me why that is? What's controversial about this or, is, or in question? I might be able to answer that, Mr. Chair. I don't think it is necessarily controversial um, it's just when we were going through various drafts with the applicant and the applicant's attorney, we had asked them particularly, let's make sure we get the description of the program, the 80%, 100% AMI and, and the, the restrictions that apply. Let's make sure we get that clear. Uh, so I think it was just highlighted because uh, it is just another one of the paragraphs that relates to how the program works. All right. It doesn't seem controversial to me, so I, I just wonder why it was highlighted. Okay. Number 11, um, shall not require modification. And number 12 deals the applicant shall create a homeowners association address maintenance of common areas and common facilities, infrastructure, trash, recycling, collection, snow removal, and other responsibilities shared by all homeowners. The master deed, um, of the homeowners association and individual units, the each shall clearly state that the individual units. All right, I guess the only question there is, does, is this broad enough for what the homeowners association is supposed to govern? And it looks to me like it does. The common areas, common facilities, structured trash, recycling, collection, snow removal, and similar responsibilities shared by old homeowners. I don't think we need anything more, any changes to that, that seems to be pretty broad. Look, guys, we're coming up on uh, eight minutes to go, eight minutes to nine. We've only gotten through the first set of uh, conditions. And, and I think that um, we're not going to be able to get very much farther in number in B if we start with only seven minutes left to go. So what I'd like to do is, in this case, is um, look towards approval. Tentatively approving number one, number two as amended, but we, yeah, number two, because that's going to just, that's just the uh, description of the program. Tentatively approve number four, number five, and number six 
leaving the number three, the regulatory agreement. Um, oh no, I would like to approve number number three because we have that. We have to come back with more language on that. So we don't approve number three. Number six, we approve. Seven, we don't. Eight, we don't at the time, current time. 10, 11, and 12, we do. So we leave out, we tentatively approve everything but three, seven, and eight. Is there any disagreement with that? This is not a, I'd like to know if there's any opposition to that. And if there is, um, so stated, if not, then we'll come back with, and fill in the blanks for three, seven, and eight at the next meeting. What's AHR? Eight is a description of the outreach program. No, no, no. The words was AHR documents. I, I would like that spelled out because I don't know what it is. It's the affordable, affordable, housing pro affordable housing program. Yep. Mm -hmm. Spelled out. Yep. Okay. Um, and with that, I would like to um, move to um, continue this meeting, this subject to a, a date certain. Rob, what's the date that we have for that? I think it was the 14th of March. Oh, you're Mr. Yeah. Chair, aren't you doing yeah. public comments? No, no, we did public comments already. Uh, we're, in the, we're in the public meeting. Uh, we did do public comments prior or earlier in the public hearing. I don't think there's anybody in the attendees that wish to raise their hand, but we, we already had public comments. So uh, the dates that I suggested were sent in email. Um, sorry, those for a different project, but the dates that we do have coming up, Mr. Chair, are um, March 14th, which to my knowledge, as of right now, does have two other potential public hearings scheduled as well. We have March 28th, which I believe Mr. Meadows won't be available for that one, if I'm not mistaken on that. Um, we also have April 11th and then April 25th, and those are all the normally scheduled meeting dates. But if the board doesn't want to delay it out by that far, we could do an off meeting date again, like we've been doing normally, um, with a date of either March 7th or March 21st. Um, any, any of those times would work. But um, the 14th would probably be advised against because we have two other public hearings scheduled before the zoning board. And this discussion seemed like it's going to warrant a full meeting. So I would recommend, and I know we've been doing a lot of these off week meetings, doing either March 7th or March 21st as a. When's, when's the six months up? I, I, well, first off, but first off, we're looking at having to get some information. Can we get it done in two weeks? And get, can you get it done in two weeks and have time to give it, given it to the board? So March 7th may be quicker than we can get everything done. Is that right? That's only so, three away. So Jessica, could you remind us again when your uh, continued hearing is for the CONCOM? Uh, we're continued to March. Um, uh, right now we're just to the 28th. It depends mm -hmm. on whether the CONCOM will render a decision on the 28th or whether they'll opt to continue. And I don't know the answer to that yet. So if we continue this to March 7th, um, do you feel there'll be ample enough time for us as staff to do research and I guess for you to update us on the process of CONCOM and then I guess to address all the other concerns the board might have in terms of having information available for the next meeting? So the list that I have, the working list was to update the waiver list and send that mm -hmm. to the town, which will be really easy. That's pretty simple. Yep. Um, we have to figure out the EV spaces. So that's coordinating a meeting mm -hmm. um the number of units that the local preference applies i could probably get an answer by tomorrow so that's not something i'm concerned about um and the income eligibility how the eligibility is determined for not related households mm -hmm. um that's the other question and i feel like i can get that answer from the 40b folks as well pretty quickly so i i think march 7th is fine I just want to get clarification on whether your public hearing is still open or closed because there is deadlines under the 40B law to close the public hearing. Public hearing is not closed. We, okay. So we moved into a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. Okay. 
So just as a reminder to the board, I have flagged that April 16th is the board's deadline for closing the public hearing. Thank you. But is it true that that could be extended if there's a written agreement between both the applicant and the board? Okay. Yes, but there has to be a written agreement. So yeah. I, you know, I. <laughs> We're hoping, Jessica, the hope is to finish before April 16th. Um, that's, that's why. That's my hope. I mean, That's really... why I specifically um, I picked out March 7th because I know that'll be the week after your ConCom meeting and that'll still be quick enough to where it won't seem like it's going to be too far out. Sure. One question. <laughs> The twenty, the fourteenth, mm. is you already have. We already have two things on the agenda for that. Have we noticed those yeah. already? Yeah, we have. We um, or we haven't yet, but we're close to. And okay. we're getting Good. a lot of special permit applications in, Mr. Chair. Right. It's just fitting them in. Well, this stuff. one is this one is got to take priority. So I was wondering if, because Jessica, you said you might have to have two con con meetings. That's what concerns Maybe. me. Maybe. Right? Yeah, we'll see what happens on the twenty eighth. I I I can I don't know. Um, mm. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I guess we should do it, take a take a shot at doing it on the seventh if people can attend on that day. Ms. Greenbaum, can you? Yes. I can. Uh, Mr. Meadows, is that going to work for you? Yes, it will. Seventh and Mr. Henry, will that work for you? Yes, it will. Okay. So let's shoot for the seventh, and we can get uh, this. The other thing that's on your list is. We got to try to come up with some language regarding um, condition eight, just some more affirmative description of what the regulatory agreement, the kinds of actions you would take in the pursuant to the regulatory agreement for outreach and counseling and uh, assistance. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes. I'm, I'm not available on March 7th. That being said, uh, you know, I, I know we're kind of at a, at a critical point um i don't have any problem getting a revised draft to you i could certainly ask one of my colleagues to pinch it for me that night but it is a little tough to come in at the very end of a project like this and um yes. not be up to speed so i i apologize for that i can't get out of this other no, I, and i apologize for not asking you and inquiring and so that's was my fault i should have done that rob is there any way that we could put the other two things on the set, the other two applications on the seventh, and move this to the fourteenth. What are the what's the availability of everybody on the fourteenth? I can. I'm not going anywhere. I can also do the fourteenth. Mr. Meadows, do you think you can do the fourteenth? I can. Mr. White, can you do the fourteenth? All right. And, and Rob, could we move the two? things that are now tentatively, you're thinking about for the 14th, we have time to notice them for the seventh. Oh, you're, you're muted, Rob. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Um, it's tricky because I would have to do the advertisement on Tuesday by noon, and it might be thrown off because of the holiday on Monday. Worst case scenario, we could just ask them if they're willing to do it on the 21st of March. Um, and this is... Yeah, and this and we can always put a panel together of people who are available. I know some people may not be available for that date. Um, they're both special permit hearings, so it wouldn't be totally burdensome. But yeah, I I think for right now it'd be wise. So if we schedule this this for the fourteenth, we can push those two hearings back to the twenty first and still have ample time to notice. So let's we this deserves a full meeting, and I would I want to get this done and over with, and I would like to have Ms. Murray there. Cause, um, Although her colleagues are very expert, and I think it is important to have the continuity, and it also gives Miss Allen and the ConCom a little bit of time in case they go longer. So okay. let's do the fourteenth. Let's reschedule the other two things. Let's go forward with that. Okay. We'll do. All right. Um, and hopefully we'll be done by the. Um, We'll show progress and get agreement on this before the deadline runs out. So you need a vote to continue to the 14th. Well, yeah, yeah, so are you suggesting the 7th and the 14th? No, I'm just... Just, just the 14th. Just the 14th. Yeah. Just the 14th. All right. Do I have a motion to continue the hearing, the public hearing and the public meeting on this matter until March 14th? So, so moved. I got a lot of... <laughs> I got... 
And I, I, I think there's a second there as well. Second. Right second. All right, we got a move and second. I don't think there's any discussion. The vote occurs. Chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Vote is five to nothing. The motion passes. All right. Um, the next order of business tonight is we move that just to make clear we move that to the 14th starting at six o'clock which i did not state but I, I need to state it now um the next order of business is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight so any matter other than this we don't have any do we rob no hands up no hands up all right the last question the last thing is new business. We normally talk about schedules, but I also want to, um, I'm trying to reduce the zoom on my screen. I want to talk to you about something, a letter I had, which I'm, I intend to respond positively to, unless I have um, any exit full screen. Here we go. Unless there's some objection. I got a letter from uh, the council president uh, asking if we wanted to have a council liaison to the ZBA. My first inclination is, you know, we council members routinely listen to the ZBA. We have really good attendance by council members. We don't need it. Um, but at the same time, I think it's also helpful to have somebody who on a regular basis may be re reporting to the town council of the workload of the ZBA, the kind of work we do. I'm pretty proud of what we do. And I think there's no reason to be, to hide our, our uh, light under a bushel basket. Um, the public, the role of the liaison is they are not voting bodies, not voting members of the body. They, they can speak, uh, during public, um, during the discussion. They don't speak during public comments. They do not express a personal opinion. These are the rules that are laid out in the town council uh, rules. They do not commit the town council to a course of action. The liaisons, when it's an in-person meeting, they sit where the public is seated. When it's a Zoom meeting, they sit in the uh, attendee section and are uh, not, in the, not in the participants, the panel sections. They receive a, the, mo the postings, agendas, reports from our body. Uh, they're not required to attend all the meetings. They are, they, and they shall report our information or budget recommendations to the full council. We don't tend to have that unless we want to give all of our staff a good raise, which might be a thing that we should, we should support and should propose. And lastly, um, they, they, they will choose who that liaison is. It's not our choice. I'm inclined to respond um, positively to the president of the, of the council. That is not a bad thing to have a, a, a council liaison to the ZBA. I think the more they know the work we do and the more they understand the workload and the issues we deal with, I think the better off we are. But I'd like just to get people's opinion as uh, board members on that. Is anybody is anybody concerned about having a council liaison and would oppose such a thing? Great. Okay. I'll inform uh, the council president tomorrow that uh, we'd, be, we'd be happy having a, a council liaison. Is there any other old business? or new business, excuse me, any other new business? If not, um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Is there a, I, Mr. White, it looks like you're seconding it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's only two o'clock in Dublin. Yeah, it's only 2.08 a.m. and I'm making legal decisions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and the bars are closed. And well, I don't drink, so oh, well, then well, that's okay. <laughs> okay, even better. All right. So the the motion is not debatable, and it, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows, aye. Mr. Henry, aye. Mr. White, aye. Miss Greenbaum, aye. All right. The motion carries five to nothing. We are adjourned. Thank you.